We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Antry and I'm here with Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, I guess we're going to get the, the latest update from Tom uh, weather wise. What, what happened this week? All right. Anything horrific? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, in Yay. fact, last week was a non-issue. Okay. I, um, I was telling my neighbors that, but it's hard to tell people who are have experienced some trauma in the very recent past that this time won't be traumatic. Well, but yeah. uh, I, I, I don't think they were being that unreasonable, Tom. If they well, I don't think so either. <laughs> I just, I was looking at the weather. I was like, I, don't, I think you guys are going to get a little over- reacting here. Sure. It was a complete non-event. Okay. I mean, well, good. There, it could have been that somebody in this neighborhood was flooded. I can't imagine mm. who. I mean, I've seen like high tides in this neighborhood be higher than that sure. <laughs> without rain, without at least that much rain. So it it was fine. It was fine. Okay. And then there was supposed to be another one on Friday, and that was even less of an event. I mean, like literally nothing happened. So everybody seems to be calming down a little bit. But the thing that concerns me is that everybody got so worked up and they uh-huh. were calling their con- council person or whatever it okay. is, uh, representative or City whatever, council. and they had – Trucks in the neighborhood, and they were mm-hmm. giving out sandbags, and all this stuff was happening, and then nothing happened. It's sort of that boy that cries wolf situation. Where <laughs> now, now when like, the next one comes and it is real, people will underreact. Is that the the issue? Well, I, 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 not so much for, as people. I think that the neighborhood will still, but I don't know that they're going to get quite as up in arms as they did okay. last time and or this time. And then uh, I don't think the city will be so quick to do something. Right. I mean, they had police <laughs> presence. They had poli- yeah. I mean, it was a, it was a, it all costs thing. money. That's, that's the case. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's the only thing that worries me. I mean, I'm glad that nothing happened. I'm certainly not complaining about it. I just, you know, that that's my one concern. Okay. Um, but yes, it was a non-issue. Uh, we, had a little bit of flooding in the in the streets, but mm-hmm. it, it, I mean, like I, I what did I say last week that I, I would be surprised if it got halfway up my driveway. Yes, it uh, there's a like a permanent puddle almost that's <laughs> that that sits in front of one half of my driveway is like circular. Okay, um, which it's just because I'm on the corner a lot, but uh, there's one part that almost always has a little bit of a puddle in it, mm-hmm. and the water in the street touched that puddle and okay. then went away in about an hour, and that's as far as it got. So Good. it was not, very much a non-issue. I will say that those of you that do watch the YouTube video, and I did have people contact me and say that after I said what we titled the, the podcast about last week. Oh, right. Yes. That many of them ran to the YouTube to find the the spot so they could see Rob's reaction oh. <laughs> when I called us a couple. <laughs> And You're so proud of yourself. Apparently, they were not disappointed. Oh, good. I did okay. not see your reaction because oh, I'm not looking right. at you. I'm looking at the camera. <laughs> so it looks like I'm looking at you, but I am not looking at you. I'm looking at the camera. So I did not see your reaction. Okay. Everything I it, we are like talk, You guys are looking at us, uh-huh. but we are not looking at. I mean, I'm not looking at you, and I don't <laughs> think Rob really looks at me. Well, I'm seeing the OBS the, feed, so I see Tom pretty clearly. Yeah. Well. I uh, I do not. I do not see him. I, I have the show notes in front of me, and that's it. And I'm reading from that, which is probably obvious by my eyes. But I, uh, you know, this is more like a telephone call for me than yeah, it is right, a yeah. than it is a video call. So I thought that was quite humorous when people were like, <laughs> "Oh my god!" When you said that, I ran to the to the YouTube. That's that's so apparently if, what YouTube is there for. There that you is go. what it's there for. Also, very soon. Rob and I are going to look more similar than dissimilar because oh. I've given up on my hair and I'm about to ah. just shave it all off. Okay. All right. It's I'm done with it. I'm I was... done. I'm done. I'm not going to do the, the try to grow it out. I'm not going to mm-hmm. spray it on. I'm, my wife says something about drawing it in last night. I'm oh, like, yeah. you shut up. You're not going shut for the up. Rogaine. You're not going for the hair No, in I'm a not can. doing it. Uh, you've okay. lost your mind if you think <laughs> I'm going to do any of that. I can <laughs> barely take antibiotics when they are actually good ah, for see. me. I'm certainly not going to take on another pill regimen. You're not regimen. going for the hair transplant surgery? Nope. Not doing right. any of that nonsense. I, mean, I really I gotta, don't care that much. 
I got a huge jump what? on mine. Before my hairline started receding, before the male pattern baldness starts kicking in, I've, I've already had the shaved head for years. So it'll my be an wife, easy transition uh, for me. My wife was uh, <laughs> was saying, oh, maybe you should grow a goatee first. And so that, you know, you do the whole old white man thing. But I think I'm not going to do that because mm. my goatee is very white these days. And I think oh, it's okay. just going to make me look 10 times older yeah. and um, of a certain political bent. <laughs> that I don't necessarily want to want to represent in my life. I mean, you wouldn't be out of place where you're living, so you know. It's absolutely. Hey, I'd fit right in a lot you of sure clubs would. around here. I guess they're not called clubs; they're called bars. Incognito or for Tom. Yes, that's me. Okay, well, over so, in yes, my, that, yeah, over in my neck of the woods, it's uh, it's been a lovely for me. I've been very comfortable for the past week, where it's been hovering right around minus nine, minus ten or so minus Celsius. Nine. Of course, that is, and uh, but, but see. What's nice is when that happens in the winter here, it's actually like crisp and kind of drier in the air as opposed to being mm. all humid like it is through most of the rest of the year. So uh, I've been very comfortable in that. Uh, most people have been complaining about the cold, but we have nothing to complain about because our neighbors, uh, one province over in Alberta, uh, some areas yes. of Alberta have hit minus 50 Celsius, <laughs> which much like plus 50, where you just stop. It's inconceivable. <laughs> the human body just kind of stops at plus 50. It also just stops at minus 50. There's, there is there is that like 100 degrees Celsius range between minus 50 and plus 50 where you can like survive. <laughs> and then beyond that range, it's that's just pretty much the end. I mean, that is the those wonderful YouTube videos where people take a actively boiling pot of water off of their stove open their porch door, throw it, and before the water has left the pot, it's frozen in the air. Like that, yeah. and that's quite literally, that they're, they're not, that's not fake. They're, there's nothing made up about that at minus 50. That's, that's just what surface happens. area. The surface area well, sure, allows yeah. it to cool down very, very quickly. That's I right. saw somebody take a, uh, a bowl of ramen, steaming yeah. bowl of ramen, and set it up so that the, the, the ramen was pulled up by a fork. Mm-hmm. And then, so you know, they basically uh, put the the bowl a little bit lower, the fork a little bit higher, uh, right, and then, yeah. like 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 secured the fork so it wouldn't fall down. Yeah, they, they put the <laughs> they put the whole thing outside. It took about two hours. Oh, okay. And it froze the entire thing solid. Oh, so the fork okay. was standing up in the air. Yes, yes, yes. The ramen was standing Held up in the, the air. Noodles. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. you know, that's got greater, you know, less surface area. Sure. So it. it it freezes more slowly. So that's. Uh, but yes, those are always fun videos to they watch, are. and always concerns me that somebody's going to do something stupid and throw it at their ah. friend and oh right yeah. that's gonna happen. but uh it's going to start warming back up now so uh so i'm a little bit sad about that but it should be fairly comfortable so uh there we go that's that's been the weather report of we are right. going to cool down tomorrow for those of you that were uh, live in florida we're going to get down to like 40s and, and oh. i'm gonna tell you right now yeah. we're not, i'm not coming out of the house i'm not leaving 40s unless right. I have that's to. actually that's actually a little bit nippy i mean it's still plus over freezing so it's not really yeah, that cool it's plus but. Yes. Yeah, but this plus single digits, and that's <laughs> cold. Uh, but and, and my wife and I were discussing this uh, this weekend because it was cold this weekend. Mm. Uh, it wasn't that cold, but it was cool. And I, uh, we were out shopping or doing something, and I had been in the house all day. I'm just like, it's just miserable because you can't, like around here, you can't leave. You can't do anything because mm -hmm. none of us have enough clothes <laughs> for all that. You know, I mean, you have like, like – you just don't you buy a jacket and I, I there's i have a jacket that i have worn like seven times yeah 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 and it's life yeah and i bought it before covid i mean <laughs> like and like three or four of those times was was because i bought it because i was going to philadelphia in the okay. winter <laughs> and i needed to, i needed to wear something and uh and that's when i wore it and then i haven't really worn it since uh just a couple of times when i was camping and you know for us, you know, we just get kind of trapped in our houses. Right. My wife was asking me, you know, like, do you prefer cycling in the cold or in the heat? I'm like, in the heat, mm. for sure, Ooh. a thousand percent. Yeah. She's like, really? I thought you'd be more comfortable in the cold. I'm like, I just, you know, I, I don't have the proper attire to, <laughs> to, to keep my body temperature where it should be. Mm -hmm. And it honestly doesn't really get cold enough for winter clothes. Sure, right, yeah. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you you will overheat if yeah. you actually wear winter clothes. This will be your because, two I mean, days of forties Fahrenheit <laughs> temperatures. That's it's it just, for the year. You know, we don't get below freezing almost ever, right. and when we do, it's for a day or two, and then you know, forties a couple of days, and then a lot of times in the in the low fifties. And low fifties is, eh, I mean, oh it's yeah, not really that that's cold. It's cold, but it's not that cold. But no, that's temperate. it's cold enough that if you're out there and cycling in the wind, sure, any you're going to be cold, but if you completely cover up you're going to be hot so it's going to 
there's kind of a catch twenty two there. Yeah. All right, let's not talk about that anymore. I can talk Indeed. about cycling We're all day. Done. This is not a cycling podcast. It should be. <laughs> I wouldn't mind being on a cycling. You do your podcast. best. <laughs> what did you watch, Rob? Because I didn't watch much. Yeah, I've got a whole bunch on my list, so I'm making up for uh, for your short list there over there. But uh, actually, last week when I said I hadn't watched any movies, uh, that that was a mistake. That was not exactly a lie because I didn't mean to deceive anybody. But it was a mistake. I did actually watch last week Gran Turismo. The fact that I completely forgot that I had watched it last week is sort of an indication of. Uh... That's the video game one, not the one with Clint Eastwood, right? Uh, no, That's... not not Gran Torino, Gran Turismo, based on the PlayStation racing video game. I heard that was pretty good. Uh, so, I mean, look, it wasn't bad. Uh, what what I would say about it is the beginning of it is pretty groan worthy. I was like, oh man, this is uh, like the dialogue is is really rough, hard to get through. You've got some really good actors in this movie, and it was cringe worthy at the beginning, like really, really super cliched stuff uh, during the setup of this movie, but. It gets better and better as it goes along. Uh, this is based on a real life story of um, for uh, while their Nissan partnered up with Sony uh, to hold these competitions where they would actually bring in the uh, highest scoring, like the uh, the fastest lap time uh, and best race score uh, people playing Gran Turismo on their PlayStations, uh, bring them in and train them in real race cars with the notion that eventually they would find somebody who could enter the actual real life racing circuit uh, and compete with with people who have who have uh, trained on real cars their entire time not just simulations via uh, a video game so uh, they're following uh, in real life the third person to win that that Nissan Pl- uh, PlayStation Gran Turismo video game tournament uh, but in the movie they make it seem like it's the first time they've ever done it you know the sure. height and the drama uh, they of course, uh, vastly speed up the timeline of everything that took place in real life because it, oh, it was over years that he eventually entered the racing circuit, but it all seems like it happens in about a month uh, in the right. movie. None of that I'm really all that concerned about. Training montage. Oh yeah, very much so. <laughs> um, but they do include, and they had the the real life person's blessing to include this in the movie. He actually uh, did the stunt race driving uh, for really? himself. You know, he didn't do the acting, the real life person, but uh, but he did the stunt race driving in the movie movie uh, for himself and he had their blessing to include uh, when he raced for the first time um, in Le Mans uh, he was involved in an accident on the track that wound up with his car careening off the track and killing a spectator um, that that happened for real um, and so there was some question as to whether they would include that in the movie because this movie was largely a an ad <laughs> for for the new Gran Turismo sure. video game. Um, but they did include it, and I mean, in terms of what it did for the movie, uh, it, it is like everything turns at that point. It it is sure. the obvious turning point of the movie, and it from fr- leading up to that point and after that point, it becomes a much, much, much better movie. Uh, so, I mean, if they had not included that that real-life event, um, th- this movie would have been an absolute stinker, an absolute groan-worthy movie, but, um, you know, it, it was effective. They, they didn't... Uh, pull the serious of it, seriousness of it at all. All of a sudden, all of these very good actors they have in this movie were able to exercise their acting chops, and uh, and it really became a much better movie after that point. So right. yeah, um, you know, if you look up in Wikipedia the actual uh, racing events and where he placed in all the races and how long it took and all that stuff, I mean, no, none of that is completely accurate in this movie, but it's all about sure. you know getting the gist of it, um, and it does a perfectly fine job that way. So yeah, uh, kind of kind of a two halves movie, right? The beginning I was like, oh, this is this is not a very good movie, and and all the cliches uh, and uh, and that that you would expect uh, from a vi- uh, movie based on a video game, but because of that uh, that real life event and including in the movie, it, it pivoted at that point and became much better um so yeah that was that one uh that was from last week uh this week um I watched uh, just a couple of the uh, South Park specials. These these were the TV specials that I think were like kind of separate from the regular airing seasons, but they came out this year. This was South Park joining the Panderverse and uh, mm-hmm. South Park not suitable for children. Uh, I, I won't comment too much on these other than, yes, uh, you can't help but laugh at the stuff that, that Matt Stone and Trey Parker put in there. They 
pull no punches. Everyone is fair game to make fun of uh, the people that they're making fun of at the beginning. They end up turning that around and making fun of the people on the other side at the end, like they very often do at South Park. But I mean, they just, they still got it. They still got it on these. It's like they they will pillory absolutely everybody on every side of every issue. Um, but yeah, I did quite enjoy, I, I think I enjoyed the Not Suitable for Children uh, special a little bit more. This was just absolutely going after the uh, energy drinks that all of the influencers on TikTok and, every, and YouTube and everything oh, are hawking yeah. all the time. <laughs> and yeah. They did a fantastic job of parodying all of that nonsense. Uh. Yes. So uh, highly enjoyable. Those... Then, uh, the one I really want to talk about is I've now seen the end of The Curse. Uh, so that is Nathan Fielder's scripted show, 10 episodes. It's on Paramount+. Plus. Um, right. So this is following on from the rehearsal from a few years ago, which was semi-scripted. This is a fully scripted show uh, starring Emma Stone and Nathan Fielder. And uh, oh, oh my goodness. Um, I was talking before about uh, I wasn't sure where all of this was leading, that maybe the curse is simply living in this constant state of feeling like what what is going to happen and that I, I was predicting that nothing would actually happen. Uh, I was dead wrong. <laughs> I'm not going to give away. Something happened. That's I was good not, to know. I'm, I'm not going to give away spoilers, but it's certainly not that nothing happened. Um, I, do, I don't want to spoil anything about this, uh, but I do want to warn people, A, it is like all of Nathan Fielder's stuff, exceedingly uncomfortable to watch, exceedingly cringeworthy. That's his favorite form of comedy is making the audience very, very uncomfortable watching what's going on. And if you don't enjoy that, then don't watch The Curse because that is absolutely what's going on here. But throughout the entire thing, you know, uh, I explained before the young couple trying to do a home and garden television show where they're renovating a whole sort of neighborhood in uh, New Mexico that's a bit dilapidated, but of course they're uh, they're they're trying to be the savior complex and, uh, oh, they respect everybody so much and, you know, the, uh, you know, have all, get nothing but praise online and all of that, that's their goal, but, um, you know, behind it all there's, there's a bit of looking down their noses at people and, uh, and all of that stuff. So all of that is very just presented to you, you know what's going on, you know what type of people you're dealing with, and throughout the series, you know, everybody, you sort of get their viewpoint of how they feel superior to someone else in that. And then as you're watching the show as an audience member, you can't, at least I couldn't, help but start to feel superior to everybody that I'm watching because you're seeing all of their foibles and you're seeing all of their uh, character flaws and everything like that. And it's masterfully done, and I will just say that uh, much like one of those very long, drawn-out Norm MacDonald jokes where, you know, there's laughs along right. the way as he's telling it, and he loves to go into uncomfortable areas and that, but you get to the end of his, of his half-hour joke, and he has one sort of lame punchline, but you can't help but laugh at it for like 10 minutes because it's just been drawn out for so darn long. Well, this is 10 episodes shown one episode per week with one punchline at the end that had me crying in laughter um, for, for like 10 minutes solid afterwards because I couldn't believe what they did in the finale and how they pulled it off. And I will just say the sheer audience contempt on display from Nathan Fielder. <laughs> is something I don't know I've ever seen done to this extent before where he's just, I just I can't help but laugh just thinking about it. I don't want to give anything away. If you're if you're interested at all intrigued by cringeworthy and then just just audience contempt punchline at the end it's a masterpiece as far as that goes okay. i don't think he's a genius i, I don't think know he's... if you're selling it for me but uh, I'll, I, i'm sure somebody's in, well intrigued. that's just it yeah i want to be honest about what you're in for uh I, sure. I think he is deranged at this point i think there's i don't know how a person writes a thing like this and okay. can, and convinces a studio to let him make it <laughs> I'm like, all right, man, you pulled it off and you sure as heck got me. And I, uh, I give him all the credit for it. And I, I was laughing and laughing and laughing uh, as okay. uh, very much as a release uh, at the end of it. Cause they, yeah, that's that's where the curse went. So, uh, yeah, lastly, both of us have watched Echo, right? Or you've seen some of Echo. So I've we'll seen the first episode. Oh, that's I it. Okay. The first episode. <laughs> first yeah. episode. Ep episode one. OK. Yes. All right. So. Oh, I, 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 yeah. OK. Yeah. So I. In the history of Marvel shows, there has never been a show that you needed to see nothing else of Marvel more. Do you actually than this show? Think that's true? <laughs> they 
recapped everything. They did recap everything. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> the yeah. first half of the first episode was, ju- I mean, it was basically a recap. I mean, there was some it of the scenes from... It was recapping the Hawkeye series, more or less, because that's where we got first introduced to Echo in the... But then the, there was uh, also some Daredevil stuff in there. There was a little bit you, of Daredevil stuff, because yeah. we're reintroducing to Kingpin, Vincent yeah, D'Onofrio's so version I thought of Kingpin. That, uh, I thought that was interesting. It's not okay. like Marvel to do that, to really recap as much as they ah, recap. Right. I mean, they really did spend the first... Like, if you've seen it all before, mm-hmm. you're like, wait a second. These are actually the same scenes. Like, they just yes, yeah. cut it from the other show and I plopped didn't it in mind. here. I didn't <laughs> I didn't mind didn't necessarily the care. <laughs> yeah, but it was... It, it did feel like, for me, as somebody who's watched all the shows, a little bit of a waste of my time. Okay. But it was certainly... Um, I, I, I liked the first episode. I thought it was fine. Mm-hmm. I thought it was good. I like her. I think that mm-hmm. she's she's holding up well uh, as, as this. And um, it's always interesting to me how quickly I forget that she really does have... She, she, like, right, she, her leg it really is fake. Is that, I mean, not fake, but is she has a prosthetic, prosthetic? leg. I, yeah. I don't actually know. I didn't I, didn't I thought that up. she did. I, I can't remember if she's got a prosthetic leg or if she's deaf I, or she's one or the other. Um, or maybe it's both. I'll have no. to look it up. But I really, I thought that she's, she's you know, carrying the show well so far mm-hmm. in the first episode. What did you think? Of, you, you watched the whole series, though. I have, uh, yeah, it's, it's only five episodes, and they aren't yeah. super lengthy episodes either. In fact, they get shorter and shorter as the series goes along. Um, so I, I actually... Uh, This ended up being more touching than I expected it to be. Uh, I thought that the best scenes that I enjoyed watching the most and engaged with the most was uh, like a lot of shows, just two people talking. Uh, And what I loved is that they had them just speaking in sign language and you're going to follow along in the subtitles and like people do, uh, particularly people who are able to hear but are conversing with someone who is deaf in sign language. Uh, You know, they are speaking as they sign, um, but often very quietly, uh, right? Or more mouthing the words than actually speaking them. Uh, It all felt very genuine, uh, and I really enjoyed that they did it. And yeah, just having these nearly silent in the soundtrack scenes uh, be that effective and be that touching I thought they pulled that off really really well uh, and really respectfully and I was very impressed with it she is deaf and she is an amputee okay there you so, go. Exactly as the character is portrayed, uh, yeah. the, the actor in real life. It, but it's that. so funny how quickly I forget that. Sure. You know, when I'm when I'm watching it, uh, I mean, I had to look it up. I knew it at some point, and I've forgotten it mm-hmm. since. So uh, you know, I, I feel like she did a she did a good job, and I agree with you. I think that. Um, oh yeah, you haven't even seen you know, the the best parts at all yet. No, I haven't. But I yeah. mean, the scenes that you've seen, it's like you. It's it's almost like I remember the 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 like the opening or towards the opening of the Hunt for Red October when mm-hmm. they're speaking in Russian. Everybody's speaking in Russian and they zoom in on somebody's mouth, sure. and then it changes to English and they zoom back out. Yeah. Um, not that that's a problem. I mean, for the for the movie itself, that wasn't a problem because you know everybody, almost everybody was speaking Russian on mm-hmm. that side, uh, and most of that was you know it would have been probably problematic to to have to read the whole thing, but. With this, you get a little bit of both. You get the mm-hmm. sign language with the subtitles, and you get the speaking with also sometimes the subtitles. Sure, <laughs> they put them both at the same time, which I thought was good. So I, I, I liked, I liked the first episode so far. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so I, I, I always have a, a, a the one thing that always I, I guess it she doesn't really concern me, but it also, so something that makes me think that I, it's not something that you would often think about is the. Um, you know, deaf people and people that are amputees and people that have uh, different disabilities, they drive. Yes. And they ride motorcycles mm-hmm. and they do things, right? And I'm like, she's driving around, or in this case, she was riding a motorcycle around and she's deaf. And yep. I'm like, wow, that must be, you know, that that you ha- you do it in a different way. You have to mm-hmm. do it in a different way. And, it, and it's always nice to be reminded that there's not everybody is exactly like you. Indeed. Because you know, we're so often... Uh, we so often assume that, hey, if I like this thing, everybody else must like this thing. And that's why when you get these toxic <laughs> fandoms where people are, you don't like this thing? How can it be? Ah. 
because everybody should be like me because I'm the best. So, <laughs> so uh, I don't want to. Yeah, go ahead. I don't want to spoil anything, of course, because no. I mean Tom hasn't finished, and I wouldn't want to spoil it for uh, audience members anyway who maybe haven't watched the show yet. But it's it's no spoiler to say to you that uh, it involves some of her ancestry. She is Native American, the main character, and it's uh, part of, uh, introducing to her family uh, that we didn't really get to see in Hawkeye at all because sure. that, that the show wasn't about her. But we're introduced no. to some of her family, and the show begins with sort of like the the uh, legendary myth of where their people came from and that's so what's going all the way back to like origins of their people type of ancestry right. uh, and that continues along the name of each episode is like a significant person in the uh in the family ah. line type of thing uh, is what's okay. going on there uh and so that plays a very significant part of this story and i liked all of that very much and i will just say my one bit of disappointment in the finale and this is not uncommon for marvel you're going to be able to guess this a mile away the actual like action scene showdown that we get is I think probably the weakest part of yeah. uh, of this whole show. Uh, not that it was weak, weak, because the characters were built strongly enough in just these five episodes that I did care what was going on. But sure. visually speaking, I felt that they really missed an opportunity um, in terms of having introduced us to this ancestral line and uh, uh, explaining to us where her superhero name of Echo comes from, because that that is like really nicely integrated into this story okay. of where that name uh, is derived from. And I felt they had uh, a, a really like obvious opportunity to uh, echo <laughs> all of that uh, history and that um, explanation of where her name came from visually in that final. Uh, fight scene. It, it was right there for the taking. There, and it's a. It would have been a pretty simple technique of of just doing the uh, depth of field type of thing right, to right. to evoke all of that. And they didn't. It was just five people flat across a green screen. And I was mm. like, oh, <laughs> it just it, the the visual just fell. I sometimes so think flat. they could just run out of money for these things. I don't you know, know what, I mean? what happened there. Yeah, it's but, not that Marvel d uh, doesn't have money. They do, but I mean, it's not like. It's not like they can throw infinite money at everything. You I know, know, but they, this they was have to like set a, budgets. Th this was a not not an expensive, complicated shot that it, you you just had to block it differently, and it would have worked so much better. Right. Um, so I don't exactly know what happened there because it's. I mean, even though like what I'm envisioning is in no way super creative it's it's a visual that I, i'm thinking of that we've seen many times before so somebody could have done something a lot more creative than what i'm envisioning for what they could have done but i'm just saying what they could have done is so simple and so obvious and would have worked so well and instead we got the absolute flattest five people standing across a green screen that i was like what on earth was that shot it was supposed to be the big hero shot and it was just Nothing. It was so visually uninteresting and unappealing. I, I, I was kind of agog that that's what we ended up with in, in the final action scene. So that was a disappointment, but um, it, it was a bigger disappointment because the rest of the show was stronger than I had actually expected it to be. I was really quite pleasantly surprised uh, at, at how touching the story really mm. was. So I, I like this. It's a big thumbs up for me as far as uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe content goes. Yeah, Rob hasn't said that in a while, so that's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. All right, that's enough of that nonsense. It is. I haven't, I have not watched much. Oh, uh, I did. I have watched more of that coma show I was okay. talking about. It has not yeah. gotten any better, and okay. in many ways, I think it's gotten. I, I kind of, I thought it might mature yeah. a little bit, kind of like the uh, the Orville did. Like the first, oh, yes, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Season was was uh, penis jokes and <laughs> crude references, yeah. and this, yeah, it, it definitely, they definitely went. You know what? We're doing Star Trek better than Star Trek, so That's let's right. just do Star Trek. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, which totally worked for me. Uh, I kind of hope that this might go that way, and so okay. far it has. I'm still mm -hmm. watching it. Um, my son likes it, and uh, so we're kind of working our way through it. But uh, yeah, and then now the, the the cycling season has started. Okay, there's a tour down under, so I'm watching that, and that's gonna unfortunately take away a lot of my time from and believe me the, don't watch it it is so boring <laughs> but <laughs> unless you're into it in which case you probably are already I, I am watching not it, advocating so this that it. anybody watch this whatsoever and on top of that even if you're into it the the youtube videos that i'm watching they have they're clearly the video that was used 
for like the commentating and everything and like you could see like like graphics will come up commentators blah 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 but none of the commentaries on there it's just oh. the footage okay. and a little bit of and like random background noises the <laughs> helicopter seems to be always present no matter Fabulous. what shots you're at but occasionally they'll have like a shot from and this is what the only really interesting thing for me they'll have a shot uh from like a motorcycle that's close to the riders mm-hmm. and you can hear them talking to each other it's on uh, you can't often make it out make out what they're saying and sometimes it's not even in english but they will be talking to each other i'm like oh it's gonna go like they were go there and believe me it is not <laughs> worth the three hours and four hours of your life that you'll have to do that mm. through that so this is av rant the podcast that answers your home theater and av questions get your questions answered all you have to do is ask us by emailing us at question at avrant.com Go to our website, find our episodes, our show notes, and our Flickr albums, where you can follow along with the pictures of which we will be discussing. Uh, you can follow, find us on Facebook.com slash Podcast, YouTube.com slash AVRant, where you can see our live recording sessions. And then eventually I will be bald. <laughs> it's coming off. All right. We've been teased. We've been teased. So, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to do the, just the buzz, like like what mm-hmm. Rob does, where it's real, real short, or if it I'm going to do the... <laughs> the every once in a while take Crew a razor cut. to it. Oh, full on take razor, a razor okay. to it, right down on, to the skin. Get get it down to the skin. Nah. I like, yeah, I don't, I don't like the half measure. I like doing I mean, it you'll, all the way. What you'll do is buzz it first, and then you'll know because you'll see where the bald patches are and whether that yeah. looks okay with just a buzz or whether it needs to be shaved right down to the skin. You'll know. Yeah. It'll be we'll an see. obvious <laughs> obvious decision. Right. So if you want to contact us directly, Rob at avrant.com. His his, uh, social media is at First Reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. If you want to send me an email, I'm also Tom at avgadgets.com. Yeah. So it should get to me too. Now, thank our listeners of the week to become a listener of the week. Support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to avrant.com. Click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and where you can leave us a PayPal donation. Apparently, everybody woke up this last week and said, we haven't done that in a while. We should do it. That's So, so nice. It is very nice. So we want to thank Tyler, David, Jason, and Raph for doing that. Wow. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tyler, David, Jason, and Raph for your PayPal donations. Really appreciate your financial support. I always feel bad when we have a couple of weeks that, that there's nobody who's done it, and mm-hmm. then we get four at a time. They get kind of lumped together. I kind of wish oh, we could I spur see. them okay. out. Yeah. You know what I mean? So they can all get their own day, but it's not the way it works. <laughs> we also want to thank our 133 patrons over at Patreon.com. Patreon's a service where you sign up to become a monthly uh, contributor to the podcast and uh, every month they'll take some money from you and give most of it to us. So 133 patrons. Thank you very much. Yeah, that is patreon.com slash AV rant podcast. If you'd like to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation. So big thanks to our 133 patrons over there. If you can't support us financially, support us in some way. We'll mention it here. Mm-hmm. Aaron sent some, uh, well, I mean, this is not supporting us actually. This is uh, <laughs> us doing a service for them. True, true. So Aaron uh, had some Canadian only movie codes for Rob to investigate to make sure that they worked. So he went through those for them. Even more, the third week in a row. Wow, Aaron. Yeah, seems like, seems like we're we're really helping you out here. He also <laughs> started getting a little far afield with UK codes and game tie-in codes. So well, yes. you, even we're, though we're, we're part of the best. Commonwealth, the UK is like, no, you Commonwealth peasants don't get to use our codes. So I can confirm right. those do not work in Canada. And uh, yeah, the, the game tie-ins, I'm like, I'm not really part of any of the... the. Uh, I mean, I have Steam just because you kind of need it for anything. But uh, I know. yeah, I'm, I'm not really like doing Steam games or, or Epic Game Store or stuff like that. So those didn't uh, help. Uh, I, I couldn't help out too much with those. But uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you, Aaron. Regardless, send those game codes nice. to me. Like, maybe, yeah. maybe I can test them out for you. Yeah, not if they're Canada fun. only. If they're Canada and they can't, but if they they work for the U.S., I'll let you know. So the notes of gratitude, we got some notes of gratitude from keeping the podcast going through all the know, things. The things. Enough. I don't know what enough terrible. Things. There's enough things. Yeah. Mike, Martin, Eric, Chris. Chris says he really enjoyed our sound bar versus 5.1 speaker discussion last week. Aaron, Henry, who appreciated our answers last week and will be keeping his Morant Cinema 70S receiver for the time being. Yay, not spending money. That's right. We This is why we don't have sponsors. And Michael. <laughs> so Mike, Martin, Eric, Chris, Aaron, Henry, and Michael, thank you for thanking us. Indeed, I'll say the names one more time. So they came from me, Mike, Martin, Eric, Chris, Aaron, Henry, and Michael. Thank you all very much for your notes of gratitude and encouragement. They're certainly appreciated. And a big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. That's right. And uh, in the news this week at CES, SVS announced their and demonstrated their new flagship series of speakers, the Ultra... <laughs> Guys, 
<laughs> Ultra uh-huh. Evolution series. Uh, there you go. Sorry, somebody watches Dragon Ball Z over there. <laughs> it comprises seven new speaker models, three towers, two bookshelves, a center, and a wedge-shaped elevation speaker. They were shown in gloss black, gloss white, uh, and then options on the show floor. But a black ash wood finish will be available as well. Probably for a lower cost, one would expect, but maybe uh, not. No, I don't think so, because on the Ultra Series, as they are, they, they, it's an actual ash uh, wood. So the uh, mm. the gloss finishes and the wood finish are all the it's same not a price vinyl the wrap. Ultra Series. Okay. Indeed, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. SVS expects to begin shipping five of the seven new speaker models as early as this March, with the full series available by the end of spring. I will have an article. Andrew's supposed to be writing an article mm-hmm. up about this stuff. For uh, AV Gadgets. Yet. Yeah, for AV Gadgets. So yeah. I'll take a look for it. When you whatever. Anyways, uh, the three floor standing models are the Ultra Evolution Tower, which is three grand a pair, the Ultra Evolution Titan, which is four thousand a pair, and the Ultra Evolution Pinnacle, which is five thousand dollars a pair. They mm-hmm. are immediately recognizable, particularly when viewed from the side, by their curved cabinets that align the voice coils of all the front facing drivers, meaning the tweeter appears to be slightly recessed, with the two mid range drivers, one above and one below, farther forward, and the pair of base woofers, one at the top and one at the bottom of the driver stack, even farther forward than the mid range drivers. It's very reminiscent of many Focal front ba- uh, baffles, and it makes it look as though all drivers are focusing their sound <laughs> to a single point some distance in front of the speakers, which will help the editors point the speakers directly at their faces. That's what you got to do. It- it'll tell you exactly what height your chair needs to be based on your own height, because you got you to get right in the middle of that curve, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And DSVS was making uh, marketing... Popular audiophile phrases like driver time alignment and coherent phase and virtual point source as supposed benefits of this more complicated uh, cabinet shape and placement of the front facing drivers. Uh, I will be honest with you, and I love SVFs. Don't don't mm-hmm. get me wrong, but um, and I'm not talking specifically about SVS. But when a company goes from trying to make the best possible product for the lowest possible price mm-hmm. uh, to I mean, we can dip our toe into the audiophile pool. When the five thousand dollar a pair price point. That's there's a they, lot of competition in yeah. that segment. When they yeah. when they start doing that, they stop talking to us as much. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see if we ever have uh, anybody from SBS back on here. I hope we do. I hope we do because I mean, it's not as though on, these are the only products SVS is offering and sells. That's right. So there's yeah, plenty and for we us to I recommend them about. all the time, and I will continue yes. to recommend them until they start offering a super tweeter. <laughs> uh, okay, this will come up. Uh, multiple AES papers have examined the audibility of precisely matching the phase of two or more drivers with uh, with the gathered data and evidence suggesting that it's not a reliably detectable vari- uh, variable. But on the other hand, it doesn't seem to hurt anything when drivers are time aligned whether by physical or electronic means and the extended diapolito array ought to be effective in controlling vertical dispersion to reduce the, the strength of ceiling and floor bounce reflections which has nothing to do with how far forward the freaking drivers are no okay? but that's a fairly well established design where you have yes. the tweeter with a driver above and below it it uh, yes. just just through sound wave interaction you yes. decrease some of the vertical uh bounces off the ceiling and floor that that's well established uh yeah. and and in aes studies has been to Detectable, so there's no reason to expect that that wouldn't be the case in this design. That it certainly Let's would, be would have that. Let's be dead honest here. Uh, yes, yeah, so this whole like curved design where yeah. you put some of the, the drivers forward and some of the drivers further back mm-hmm. has is very popular with an audiophile ish sure. circles. Well, like I say, um, it that, definitely looks like like uh, the the Focal Canta series looks almost yeah. exactly like these. Yeah, but you even see other other manufacturers that'll just do it with the tweeter at the top and then they'll the, the whole speaker looks like it's laid back yeah. um and which doesn't you know whatever and uh honestly fine it looks it makes your speaker look unique and in, in another black box from svs well, really that's just wasn't it. wasn't gonna wasn't gonna stand out wasn't well, like, gonna, yeah, w- let's wasn't gonna make imagine- people wonder they had gone yeah. with this five driver on the front of the speaker design, but just put it in a straight up and down big black or white rectangle. Right? right. It, it would have like it would have been an imposing, rather uninteresting shape if that's 
all it was. So by For adding sure. this curve, it adds a bit of visual interest. They're going into this $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 per pair uh, market with these speakers. They are aiming the tower models very much at the two-channel listening crowd. And so, you know, having that something... Uh, like immediately identifiable visually. I don't blame yes. them for wanting that in their design because there is value to that. And, and there's there's a th there's a thin line. We talk I talk about this a lot on AV gadgets as well as on this mm -hmm. podcast about how marketing really works. Yeah. And many times what you do is you say we have time aligned the drivers and they leave it up to. And I I didn't read the marketing and I didn't hear the interviews uh, with SVS, so I don't know exactly mm -hmm. how they said it. But we time the, the, the time aligned the drivers that, so that the phase is more coherent and blah blah blah. And then let the listeners just. Uh, in, interject. Yes, draw that, that your own conclusions. Thing. That's right. Yes. Yeah. That, that's that. That makes a big. That makes a difference. Yeah. Whereas, like, yes, we did do these things, mm -hmm. but really, we did it because it looks cool. You know what I mean? Right. Versus doing it because, but it is that disingenuous? Is that slightly on the manipulative side? Right. Yeah. You know, I, I would argue yes, but I could see icky feeling. Yeah, yeah. But but like I say. You know, with this design that they've done, as far as, you know, all of the Audio Engineering Society studies that have, uh, you know, tried these things to see if people could detect them in blind listening comparisons, it's like, it wasn't a benefit, but it wasn't a harm. So mm -hmm. it's not as though by doing this, whether it's purely for the visual interest or not, that they've actually done some kind of detriment to the performance of the speaker. This isn't going to be a problem by having yeah. this curved front face. So, yeah, I, I don't have a, I don't have a problem with it you know, because it doesn't affect the performance in a negative way. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. And so the, the thing you have to ask yourself is, from my perspective as a buyer and somebody who's going to suggest these speakers to other people, what is the actual benefit of these speakers mm -hmm. over the other offerings within the SVS line? You know, they clearly the louder. ultra... <laughs> yeah, that, well, that's they, what we're going to get to here. Straight up, play louder. Yeah, <laughs> then that's what we're going to get to here in a second. But when we go from the 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 prime to the ultra series, there is a I think there is a step up in mm -hmm. overall quality, uh, both of how they look and how they sound, and then also the amount of volume that they can put out mm -hmm. is also increased. Yeah. So let's continue with this. So perhaps even more interesting from the curved cab, uh, more interesting than the curved cabinets and front facing driver layout is the presence of two more base woofers in the back of each floor standing speaker, two, the two top woofers front and back. Uh, plus a tuned port are housed within their own enclosure within the cab uh, floor standers cabinet, as are the bottom two woofers front and back, plus their own tuned port. The tweeter and dual mid-range stack is also isolated with its own uh, within its own enclosure inside of the cabinet. So it's almost like three separate speakers in one. Yeah. So you see this a lot more. People don't talk about this many times in speakers like the whatever they do not talk about the fact that many times within a floor standing speaker there will be enclosed areas for yes. certain drivers they want to they, they don't want that tweeter to have the entire back of that cabinet that's right available to it yeah, a it's lot not of times one open cavity of a cabinet inside of this speaker there are that's separate what enclosures in there often think they'll see these sure. like these cutaways and they'll have all the drivers and then actually have like a folded horn which has a yeah. uh, a horn at the bottom of the back of the of the of the floor stain speaker but then the the front you know it has a in in the middle it has a a partition that goes almost all the way to the top of the the, the the speaker so that the air has to go all the way to the top of the speaker from the bottom of the woofers sure, all the way sure, to the sure, top yeah. all the way back down to the bottom to go out the port which is what we call a tuned port or folded horn sometimes we'll call that and uh that's usually not the case many times when you cut a, uh, cut into a really well designed speaker you'll see that the tweeter has its own little enclosure mm -hmm. the mid-range drivers have their own enclosures and then the rest of it is for the base and sometimes some of it's just closed off period and it's just mm. a stand. So um, this is this is very interesting here. So basically there's three speakers in here. There's three different yeah. places, which is why... There's like two dual opposed ported subwoofers, one at the yes. top, one at the bottom, and right. then a uh, 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 self-contained, like the tweeter has its own backing on it. So that's like one Let's contained base driver. Modules. Let's not call them subwoofers. I think that's... Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you know what I mean, base, yeah, base I know what you mean. producing things. And then, yeah, you've got the mid-range drivers and tweeter stack, and that's all separated as well. So if you look at the back of a tower speaker and you see a port halfway uh -huh. up the cabinet. Yep. <laughs> like okay. you do on these. 
it will tell you something about what you are what is inside so if you awesome. see a, yes. a a port at the bottom then the bottom portion of that at the very least is being used for base okay mm-hmm. if you see at the top the bottom portion or not the part like in the mid range like if there's three like a lot of times on tower speakers you'll see a a, a woofer a tweeter and a woofer right yes. yeah. at the top and then there'll be a port in the back kind of behind or right near the bottom woofer. Mm-hmm. That probably means that that top portion is cordoned off from the bottom. Like yeah, there's separated. nothing yeah. on the bottom yeah. at all. It's just stand that you're paying for. So you're, it's basically a mid uh, a bookshelf speaker with a stand integrated yeah, into it. Yeah, all integrated into one cabinet, yeah. yeah. So if you see multiple ports, that tells you there is more than one cabinet inside there, one more than one space mm-hmm. that's inside there that is needing to be ported. Uh, and there may be even more than that, like in the case of this one. So, uh, where am I at in this thing? We're down at the, uh, yeah, talking the about all of the woofers. Tweeter and dual mid-range stack is also isolated. Okay, I already said that. Yeah. So, all of the woofers fire in phase together by uh, by firing out of the front and the back at the exact same time. The physical vibrations are canceled, just like dual opposed woofers of uh, the SVS's own 3000 micro sub. And even though the rear facing woofers and two separate ports are easily visible on the back of each floor standard, SVS said it's totally fine to position them close to the wall behind them because the curved shape of the cabinet ensures that no no port noise or rear facing woofer will actually come in contact with the wall. Yeah. Okay, I mean, who's going to put them so dang close to the wall that the woofer's going to hit it? I mean, that's ludicrous, <laughs> but whatever. No, but it's just a, it's kind of built in because of that curve of the uh, back part of the cabinet as well that you can kind of like butt the 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 rearmost part of yeah. it there acts as like a, a little uh, fulcrum. <laughs> yeah, I can't suppose. Go past. Yeah. yeah. Not to be lost in all this is a new tweeter. It's a one-inch aluminum dome, an evolution of the Ultra Series tweeter, but now it has a micro-thin layer of vapor deposited synthetic diamond coating it to get it F, uh, to give it extra stiffness that extends the upper frequency breakup mode to around 40 kilohertz which is great for cats or dogs or something i don't know dolphins bats <laughs> no, platypuses i don't know what's the platypus hearing range and rather than a waveguide svs has opted to place a lattice diffuser over each tweeter that is meant to create more uniform dispersion across the tweeter's entire frequency range all right, I haven't seen this. I haven't seen this close enough to know what that looks like. Ultra Evolution Tower uses a pair of four and a half inch glass fiber mid range drivers with four five and a quarter base woofers. Titan increases the base woofer base woofer size to six and a half, and Pinnacle makes the mid range drivers five and a quarter. And the four base woofers each are, are eight inches each. So. Um, on the pinnacle, just the just the pinnacle. Just on the pinnacle, yeah. The pinnacle has four eight-inch uh, base woofers and then five and a quarter-inch mid-range drivers. Uh, and then when you go down to the Titan, uh, it's six and a half-inch base woofers, four of them, and then four and a half-inch uh, mid-range drivers. And then the tower keeps the same four and a half-inch mid-range drivers, but goes down to five and a quarter-inch base woofers, four of them. So yeah, just different sizes of the same design. Uh, so the bookshelf, the Ultra Evolution bookshelf is $1,300 a pair. It uses the same twi- tweeter and a single six and a half inch driver and the same voice uh, voice co- coil alignment thingy, giving the front face a slight curve mm-hmm. with the woofer physically forward of the tweeter. So leave that a little bit. Uh, Ultra Evolution Nano, it's $900 a pair. It really isn't that small. It's just a five and a quarter inch woofer version of the bookshelf with a suitably sized down cabinet to match. The Evolution uh, Center, Ultra Evolution Center, is $900 each. Uh, uses the same diamond-coated tweeter plus a single four-and-a-half-inch mid-range driver pos- uh, positioned directly below the tweeter with a six-and-a-half-inch woofer on either side. The face of the Evolution Center is raked back slightly so that, once again, the voice coils of the tweeter and mid-range are physically aligned. Whatever. Yep. And finally, the Ultra Evolution Elevation, sorry, Ultra Elevation, officially doesn't have Evolution in its name. Uh, <laughs> again, $900 a pair. It gets the same diamond coated tweeter and single five and a quarter inch driver as the Nano. But of course, it's in a wedge shaped cabinet and the tweeters are at the bottom and it comes with SVS's versatile mounting system. It makes it relatively easy, relatively easy to attach uh, it to a wall or ceiling, ceiling in just about any orientation. The existing Ultra Series speakers will be phased out once the Ultra Evolution Series launches in full. So keep your eye on SVS's website. There are sure to be good deals offered on the outgoing Ultra Series soon. And of course, you'll want to be there if you intend to be amongst the first to own the new Ultra Evolution Series. 
okay, you know Kurt, right? He's co-hosted when I was out. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He just bought some 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 ultra bookshelf speakers. Nothing wrong with that. He, he just bought they didn't them. Get I, any and, worse? And the FOMO is going to be so freaking oh, real. <laughs> it's going to be so bad. <laughs> To, to buy the speaker right before they phase them out. Oh, my well, God. Well, I mean, you know, SVS, if you call them up and you're like, I bought these uh, oh, speakers know. within the year, they're they're going to fly that past the, the finance committee yeah, and see yeah. how that's going to work. But I, mean, I, I think I, it was a negotiation to get the speakers that they got. I would frankly be surprised if you didn't get the response from SVS that, <laughs> yep, we will pay for the shipping for you to send them back and you pay the difference in price and you can get the Ultra Evolutions in their place because they, they do that upgrade program on all their subwoofers if you've had them within a year. So uh, I would what. be kind of shocked if they didn't do that for people who just bought Ultra Series speakers. So they're still going to have the Prime Elevation speakers. Primes are right. still around. There has been no announcement changing the Prime Series, but the Ultra Series that we have today is being phased out. The Ultra Evolution is taking its place. I and there is no world where I would recommend these uh, evolution at whatever they're called the the elevation ones ultra um, ev- ultra unless, elevations yeah yeah unless you're sitting very far away from them and you need the it's the higher output. output that's yeah, what it's for that would be the only reason yep. that I would even consider this. Uh, I mean, nine hundred bucks a pair. That's 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 spendy, but it's it's not as expensive as other wedge shaped options that we've seen out there. But so I'm saying still over the there. prime, over the prime, over the prime elevation, over the yeah. prime. Yeah. yeah, I don't think sonically you're going to notice any real it's difference here. So I, I mean, especially in the locations that you normally put them and everything else. Yes, it's just God. it'd be so. You know how much easier it would be if we could buy into all the garbage that's out there nah. and not that saying that these <laughs> this is garbage i'm not saying that no, it's not but garbage. if we could if we could really buy in to all the marketing stuff that there are so say. many places for people to go if that's the attitude that they want to hear from their podcasters or reviewers or whatever so we're, we're the difference tom well we are the difference but it also makes us unpopular with manufacturers i'm going to be honest <laughs> with you does not help our cause in that. Uh, well, us what do you think this marketing is? Job. Marketing isn't about like one hundred percent truthfulness, and how is it? <laughs> you know, and it's like I said, I, and I'm not talking about SVS here. Uh, companies, as they migrate towards yeah. uh, being more successful, they want to capture a larger portion of the market, and, and they want to get into the higher margin sections of the that's market. That's right, and. Yeah. I just, I mean, I just, at some point, I'm just like, it's not worth it. You're not going to, you're not going to hear any difference. But hey, at least these speakers will be louder. There you go. (laughs) Phil, okay, next in the news, filling in the last of the big TV announcements uh, for, out of uh, the TV announcement news out of CES after last week, Hisense Mm -hmm. naturally had to have an announcement to its rivals, TCL's 115 inch QM891G. So they showed off their 110 inch. So close. I know. Came up short. UL, ULEDX. Well, it might have been five inches smaller in diagonal screen size. They packed it with 40,000 mini LED local dimming, dimming zones versus TCL's paltry 20,000 zones and mm-hmm. doubled the peak brightness to claim the full 10,000 nits. You too can go blind in your own home. <laughs> I no mean, tone mapping needed there. Yeah, that's what uh, HDR10 and Dolby Vision go up to maximum. The maximum data value in the signal would equal 10,000 nits. So there you go. If your TV can do it, you don't need to tone map anything. You got to tone map it if it's just a one-to-one. So it's also an 8K TV. So if it actually releases in North America, the price point will likely be higher than TCL's under $20,000 target for their 115-inch model. Hisense will also be expanding their UX series to include 75 and 98-inch screen sizes. The UX series only came in 85-inch screen size last year. They say the 98, 98 will get 10,000 local dimming zones and reach 5,000 nit peaks. And the 75-inch will get 5,000 local dimming zones. So there you go. That's the high sense news from CES. Portrait Displays, the maker of the popular Calman Displays calibration software, hit a major snag after they announced their new uh, C7 HDR colorimeter, 
which was going to be the first consumer meter suitable for measuring up to 10,000 nits at the price of just $300, with the option to update specific display profiles via simple uh, downloadable updates. We were quite excited about it, or at least Rob was, because he's the one that wrote this. That's Sadly, right. they hit a major manufacturing issue. The exact specifics had not been made public. And anyone who had pre-ordered was sent the following email. Deal, dear valued customer. Oh, that's never a good sign. I know, right? <laughs> It's like getting a call. Are you sitting down? Mm. No, and I do not want to. Don't talk to me. We are reaching out with an update regarding your C7 HDR color colorimeter order due to unforeseen supply chain issues. I mean, that covers all manners of sins. The manufacturing of the C7 HDR has been discontinued indefinitely. Yeah, that's that, kind of a key word there. My guess is they showed up and none of them worked. Something and, went wrong. Very, very and, wrong. Yeah. Because they and, were up to the pre-order phase. So that means yeah. like they had physically developed this thing. There's no question about it. They were on to the pre-order phase of things. And then we don't know exactly what went wrong, but yeah, something well, went very yeah. wrong. There's, yeah. no, there's no way of knowing what went wrong. But whatever it was, no. it was not fixable. We regret to inform you your order has been canceled. You'll be issued a refund automatically. The old Okay, so that's the end of that. Yeah. So the old C6 HDR 2000 meter has its listing back on Portrait Display's uh, own online storefront as its previous price of $795. However, as something of a make good, if you buy the C6 meter bundled with any version of Calman's home software, it's $145 on its own. The bundle price is $450. That's $50 more than the C7 plus Calman home bundles uh, were uh, pre-selling for, but it's still a lot less expensive than buying the old C6 HDR 2000 meter on its own. So there you go. Yeah. But developed alongside the now defunct C7 HDR color emitter was the Portrait Display's G1 pattern generator. And unlike the C7, the G1 is fully available to purchase now. They're charging $550 for it on its own, but you can get it for basically 200 bucks when you bundle it in with any version of Calman Home, so 350 gets you the Calman Home plus the G1 pattern generator, or you can get the software, the meter, the C6 meter, and mm -hmm. the G1 all together for 650, which is still less than the meter by itself. <laughs> That's right. Yes. So kind of why, why would you? <laughs> yeah. Why would you buy the meter all by itself when you can get a uh, Calman Home software and the G1 pattern generator for $100 less or $150 less than buying the meter all by, uh, yeah, the uh, C6 all by itself? So the G1 includes 21 calibration test patterns with automated control via Calman software. The G1 only works with Calman, so it's useless with any other calibration software. It can output a maximum of uh, 4096 by 2160 resolution at 60 frames per second via its HDMI 2.1, I'm sorry, 2.0 connection. Yeah. And while it supports SDR, HDR10, Dolby Vision, and HLG, it does not support HDR10 Plus at this time, although it can be updated, so perhaps that will be added in the future. It seems like that shouldn't be a problem if you can do all the rest of them. Indeed, yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah it, it, you know, key here, it is not HDMI 2.1. It is not 40 or 48 gigabits per second. It is not doing 120 frames per second. It is 18 gigabits per second HDMI 2.0. So yeah, if you wanted to test the absolute limits of some of your uh, you know uh, display things, it, it doesn't have that capability but yeah if you're able to get it for basically 200 bucks when you buy it along with the calman home software uh not such a bad deal you know if you don't have other ways of generating patterns in a you know absolute reference quality you know for sure that pattern is exactly the values it's supposed to be that's what it's, it's there for yeah well, i i mean there was a time when we might have recommended this and i'm not saying that it's not useful for people i just don't think that for most people it's going to make enough of a difference it's definitely a to... niche of the enthusiast crowd yeah so CES 2024 also brought an announcement from the UHD Alliance regarding Filmmaker Mode. For the first time since Filmmaker Mode was created, it will now be available as an option for Dolby Vision content on TVs that support it. So far, LG's 2024 OLEDs and some of uh, its LCD TVs are the first to announce official support. This came out as happy news to our listener, Martin, who has been wondering about Filmmaker Mode and why it didn't show up as an option when showing Dolby Vision content. Mm -hmm. Apple TV Plus is also going to offer auto switching into filmmaker mode if you enable the signal flag. LG and Samsung TVs will be the first to support this feature with their built in Apple TV apps. Okay. There it is. More filmmaker mode available for you. All right. Questions. Bradford. 
Bradford has a Sony HD770 receiver. A DH770 receiver, I got there. You didn't have to correct mm -hmm. me. It has seven amplifiers built in, but the only use is a 5.1 speaker setup. So the surround back front height binding posts are currently unused. This receiver does not have any sort of zone two op option, but those surround back binding posts can be assigned, assigned as front B outputs. So he was wondering if he would like to have the option of putting a pair of Bluetooth speakers on the patio or in the dining room so that he can hear the football game while it's also on the TV in the living room. Could he do the following? Set the surround back binding posts to front B. Run those speaker wires to a line level converter. He found one from Rust Sound. Run the line level output to a Bluetooth transmitter. And now I'll have a stereo Bluetooth signal that duplicates what's being played on the 5.1 system. The Rust Sound uh, ADP 2.1 line level converter seems super simple. So is it going to result in terrible sound quality or could this actually work? It'll work. I don't see any reason it why it wouldn't. Well, it should function with a caveat that I'll describe in just a moment. Uh, it is also going to be laggy compared to everything else. So if you... Huh? If, if, why if, would it... If, oh, because well, of the, the Bluetooth. The Bluetooth, the Bluetooth yeah. Yes. Not, not because of the line level conversion from no. speaker wire to uh, RCA connection. That isn't going to introduce any la lag, but uh, the Bluetooth transmitter might introduce some, yeah. Yeah, so there's going to be a little bit of lag there. I mean, how much is... Uh, I wouldn't want it to be in the same room with me. Mm. I'll put it to you that way. But if you're going to have it in a completely different space, like, yeah, like out, out on the patio, it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. yeah. As long as, okay, I don't, DVRs used to introduce a bunch of lag. Mm. And I mean, it's used to, they still do introduce lag. Uh, so I remember watching like the Super Bowl many, many years ago mm -hmm. and hearing people cheer outside before whatever yeah, the yeah, play yeah. was was finished on the TV. I don't know if it'll quite be that bad, but there will be some lag. Uh, that yeah, I mean, if you may, get a Bluetooth transmitter experience. and a Bluetooth speaker that both use uh, Bluetooth low latency, um, you know, that definitely reduces it. Uh, you know, it's right. only, only about 10 or 20 milliseconds at that point, which is fairly undetectable. So uh, yeah, there are ways around that on the Bluetooth side, but as as far as the yeah taking the speaker wire output of the uh you know uh, surround back binding post set to uh speaker B front B uh having that go through that rust sound uh, line level converter that there's no problem with that it's not going to degrade your sound quality it's right. a fairly simple process uh that's going on inside of that converter just to change it back to line level however the one little caveat that I uh prefaced about is that if you want to be having the sound in the living room and in the second room at the same time, you are going to have to set the living room to stereo listening mode. Um, there, uh. It doesn't have like some sort of converter that's going to take the 5.1 surround sound signal and down mix it to stereo for those front B speakers. The front B speakers are just going to play exactly what the front A speakers play. Uh, Which so, would be yeah. funny in surround sound if you had it in surround well, sound. Well, it also be... just it just doesn't function at that point. This, this, <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> there's a doggo barking. But these That's speakers, because there's somebody at my door. I gotta go. Yes. <laughs> the speakers B are only gonna work properly if you have the speakers A playing in stereo listening mode. So that's not the end of the world by any means. You know, you're gonna have stereo listening mode playing in the living room and then uh, have that exact same sound coming out of the surround back binding posts that has been set to speakers B. Uh, but then he goes on to ask the Bluetooth transmitter that he was going to use. It does not have RCA inputs. Uh, it has a stereo 3.5 uh, millimeter input jack, like a headphone uh, jack, right? The smaller headphone jack. Uh, so since the Rust Sound uh, line level converter uh, that he was going to use, it only has RCA outputs. He's uh, wondering, would there be any concern using a simple RCA, red and white RCA plug to stereo 3.5 millimeter? cable is there going to be any sort of concern just doing that does he need any sort of like adapter or is just the cable going to work fine for that part of it it isn't going to make it into a mono signal or ruin the sound quality in some way and absolutely not it's totally fine to do that it still is a stereo signal the plug the physical plug looks different but as long as it is a stereo 3.5 millimeter and the way that you tell um when it's mono it's what they call a TS or a tip sleeve. So what you'll see is the the tip of the plug on that 3.5 millimeter plug and then just one little black band and then solid metal behind that. So there is the tip, the one little black band separating it and then the sleeve. That would be a mono 3.5 millimeter plug. Uh, but he's got an example that we're showing on screen here or you can see in the Flickr album where it is um, a tip ring sleeve 
uh, configuration, TRS. So you've got the tip, the little black ring, then a metal ring there and another black ring separating that from the sleeve so you got three metal connections there separated by the two little black rings the tip ring sleeve will be stereo uh instead of being mono so it's perfectly fine to use that and there's no problems whatsoever tom is just sitting back down and i am uh, there's a I got good to the chance. end of that question so all right there's a good chance i'm not going to bank it through this uh, oh dear okay the, well we're on to jack a, anyway there is a um anyways there's there's a there's stuff a going AC, on. AC guy here. I see. Okay. He's supposed to stay outside. He's not supposed to be here at all right now. Ah. At least not to my knowledge. But he's here, and now I have to deal with him. So Okey-doke. he's he's outside for right now. If you hear the dogs going crazy again, I'm gonna have to leave. All right. Jack. Jack wants a Bluetooth speaker recommendation. It's for pole vaulting practice. This is with the pole vaults. Huh? So he's uh, northeast Ohio, and they continue to vault in the snow outdoors if they if they need to. <laughs> Good for them. So the Bluetooth speaker needs to be up to that task. Although he's not looking for it to be full DJ party setup or anything. He says, keep the budget reasonable. But to him, anything with less than two zeros at the end is downright cheap. So a few hundred dollars, we guess. Um, yes. So I have the perfect speaker for you. Okay. Actually. So on AV Gadgets, I reviewed this. Uh, I'm going to have to look it up real quick. Mm-hmm. Uh this Bluetooth speaker that uh, is made for all weather. It all is, weather conditions. It okay. is like this thing. And it is not heavy. And I did not love it for inside. Okay. Because inside it sounded not good. Oh, okay. Uh, it's called the Exo Gear. Mm-hmm. E- e- or Eco X Gear. Eco X Gear. Eco X Gear. E- Eco X Gear. All one all right. word. Eco Journey. It's a waterproof. It's a waterproof speaker and a case. So it's okay. like the, it's built into the lid of the case. It is almost non-functional as a case. I'll be yeah. honest with you. <laughs> but it's the lid's so heavy that it's impossible to do really mm. do anything with. And the case inside is not that big. Okay, but let me see what the price is on this. Yeah, yeah. Price point is going to potentially price, matter in here. Yeah, the price point, I remember not being... So the the thing I was, like, not in love with on this thing was the... Uh, why can I not search? I don't um, <laughs> That's some great pod right. right there. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I got it. I got it, I got it, I got it. <laughs> nope, that's <laughs> a four. <laughs> 200 bucks. Okay. So okay. Uh, for $200, the, the thing I didn't love about this thing is inside it sounded like garbage. I mean... Mm. I really hmm. did not like it hmm. inside, but out. But I took it out into my backyard and I turned it up really loud, yeah. and I was like, "This sounds pretty good," uh, okay. which makes a lot more sense yeah. to me. So, uh, if I were, in fact, I have. If I were to, if somebody would say, "Hey, I do fitness classes outside," mm-hmm. or I, you know, you know, I, uh, I have big parties in my backyard or stuff in my backyard and I want to play some music and I want it to yeah. be kind of loud. This thing works really well. Okay. For 200 bucks, um, you can find, I'll, I'll put the review in here, yeah. but it is, it, it, it was kind of crazy. I was really going to slam this thing until I saw this and it gets quite, quite loud. I don't know that it gets um, how loud you really need it to get, but I think it's going to get loud enough for you to have music out there while mm-hmm. you're doing stuff. And as far as waterproof, I mean, this thing is throw it in the ocean. Okay. Waterproof. So, yeah. All right. Eco X gear, Eco journey, waterproof speaker, uh, 200 yes. bucks. All right. So I'm just borrowing, uh, from Bluetooth speakers, um, uh, I IPX rated Bluetooth speakers that I mentioned last week at a variety of price points. Um, so coming in less expensive than the one that Tom just talked about, but not as powerful. It's only a 70 watt amplifier. And the one I'm about to mention, which is the W King X 10, but it goes for $115 and it has an IPX rating for dust and water resistance and it has like a strap so it's quite easy to carry around uh, long battery life on it and you know plays re- reasonably loud I don't know if it'll be quite loud enough for uh, outdoors during pole vaulting so uh, that might be a question mark but if you just need the price to get lower 115 bucks that W King X10 uh, is definitely recommended as a Bluetooth speaker and then uh, one that I would point a lot of people to in a situation like this would be Ultimate Ears Hyper Boom but that's going up to $400 so it's double the price right. of the one that Tom talked about but this is definitely IPX rated you can it's kind of meant to be like thrown into a pool <laughs> so it's yeah. that that type of uh, resistance there but this thing gets crazy loud uh, lots of thumping bass so it, it definitely could be something that you use 
The last one I'll mention, even more expensive at $450, but there is Sonos's Move 2. Uh, really, really long battery life on that. And I only mention that because, again, anytime someone is already in the Sonos ecosystem, if they're just looking for a speaker that they can also use as part of their Sonos system, I'm glad Sonos has a solution for that. This is portable. It is Bluetooth. But then, of course, it also integrates with the Sonos system if it's near one of those. So the Sonos Move 2 for $450 is, is an option that, that you could also consider. So just to kind of like give you a little bit more about the one I'm talking about, it's yeah. 100% waterproof. It's IP67. Right. Okay. So that's like the highest. Yeah. I don't think it gets any higher than that. Uh, it's sandproof. It's waterproof. It's shock resistant and it floats. Uh, it's got 100 cubic inches of storage for your phone key, wallet, whatever on the inside, mm -hmm. which is also waterproof. Okay. So the storage, anything you put in there is protected as mm -hmm. long as you close mm -hmm. it. It's got 50 plus hours of play time with the aver at average volume levels. That's 10 hours if you max it out. Okay. If you put it as high as it can go, it'll still last for 10 yeah, hours. It's yeah, got like yeah. a 20,000 milliamp or whatever it's called, eight cell lithium battery. And it says... Uh, 65 watts, I don't know. I think it's probably between all the drivers, but 110 dB at one foot. Yeah. I don't know, but it gets pretty loud. It's got three marine-grade speakers. So oh, okay. this is, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm, when I say yeah. this thing is meant to be placed outside, yeah. it is meant to be placed outside. Yes. You know? So if you're worried mostly about that, um, this is this is yeah. good. And it charges very quickly. Uh, it has, a, or I mean, it has a fast charge. Mm. Uh, USB-C jack in it. So anyways, check that out. See which one works for yeah, you. Yeah, certainly amongst that range of price ranges that we uh, hit there, something should do the trick for you. Yeah. Mine is ugly, though. So you've got gotcha. that going for you. And the controls are on the front. Ugly sometimes good, because if it's sitting out there and somebody doesn't have their foot on it, you know, nobody's going to steal it if they don't like the way it looks. That's so right. That helps. That's right. <laughs> Mike, Mike wrote this previously about his Panasonic Plasma TV in his family room that would power on but only show a garbled... Uh, image of blue lines as soon as you tried to show it tried to show any HDMI input in case a repair is either too expensive or not possible at all. We suggested a high sense U7K as a potential replacement since he needs to deal with some fairly bright lighting conditions, but he's had to deal with several electronic items failing on him the past year, so he wants to keep the price down. <laughs> we mentioned how we like the semi matte finish on the high sense. I like he says we. Yes. Uh, the <laughs> royal really we. Yeah, the Royal Rob. The AV ran uh, <laughs> The semi-matte finish on the Hisense U7K for uh, handling light reflections and glare, but we did warn that it has pretty narrow viewing mm -hmm. angle and, and doesn't look good from off-access. Well, he has a sofa over the side of the room that uh, that's near the window, so for some reason, guests tend to favor that spot. Well, screw them! <laughs> Yeah, you're going to have a washed-out color, low-contrast image from over on the side there. Yes, but. So he popped over to Best Buy to have a look at that Hisense U7K, and while the price point is good, he isn't going to... It isn't going to cut it from off axis. The image really degrades a lot when you view it, view it from off to the side. It's true. Right. It's fine. Yes. Naturally, that was no issue with this plasma, and it wouldn't be any problem for an OLED. So what do we think about keeping an eye out for the lowest price on, say, an LG B3, since those ought to be going in clearance fairly soon with the new B4 and C4 and G4 models starting to roll out? Mm -hmm. like, I mean, I got no problems with it. I mean, I, I've written an article that says OLED's fine in bright rooms as long, I mean, with light in your room. What you really mm -hmm. don't want is light physically touching it. <laughs> you know, like, you well, know what I mean? Direct, you don't want, like, light directly opposite the window. Yeah. Yeah, because that'll, that'll definitely, uh, you risk damaging the, the, the panel itself mm. if it's getting direct UV radiation. On oh, it. I see. But, right. It also uh, just doesn't look terribly good in that condition. Well, I, the, yes, but God made screen uh curtains for a reason so certainly right. you can deal with this i mean there's a lot of ways you can deal with this the first yes. is you said that guests sit over there mm -hmm. who cares about that <laughs> i was not joking like if it bothers them enough they can move to the better seat they which can is move available. yeah okay and if you really care and you want to like make sure that you can see good off you know whatever you can get a uh a, a, a tilt mount mm -hmm. That can actually go on the furniture or sit on the as, like there's stands, right? There's little stands that you can put on top mm -hmm. of your furniture that you can connect that will allow this thing to be tilted or or swiveled, uh, if you cared that much. Mm -hmm. Or you know you could just just say, hey, sit here. If they go to sit there. They'll say, no, sit here instead. Oh, this looks more. Co I don't care. Sit here. Mm. I got an idea. Get rid of that couch. Boom. Ah. Problem solved. 
I mean, I certainly will say, um, you know, for his own uses coming from a plasma, yes, you're going to notice the picture quality yes. upgrade going to the OLED more than you will the lateral or in certain ways, slight downgrade going to the LCD. So I think that's playing into this a little bit. Uh, but I mean, I do want to caution you, sure. right? If any reflections that you're seeing in an LG OLED are going to be like looking into a mirror that has a black background because it is very clear reflections that yes. you see in an OLED screen. So that's just, it's just something to be aware of. Um, what I might actually say on that front, uh, because the price points are not vastly different, um, maybe have a look at Samsung's S90C quantum dot OLEDs uh, because the screen finish that they put on the Samsung S90C it's a bit less reflective like the the reflections are just not so clear <laughs> it, you know it, it just sort of diffuses that light a little bit more on that S90C screen finish and the price point is like it's it's virtually exactly the same as the C3 series and actually gets like 100 or 200 dollars less than the C3 series quite often putting it very much in the same sort of price category as the B3 uh, when those sales happen so I mean look we know the S90D series was announced at CES it's coming out in the same time frame so we're gonna have clearance sales on the S90C outgoing Samsung models and I just think that overall it's a bit brighter than the B3 series the screen finish is a little bit friendlier with reflections so maybe keep an eye on that S90C series from Samsung it might fit the bill just a little bit better in your situation and it definitely still has the excellent off-axis viewing all right yeah. on a different topic but contributing to his desire to keep prices down they finished their backyard space last year and as well uh, as well and they added a hot tub directly off their porch landing so you could dive in, I guess, from the porch. You could just walk uh, right into the hot tub. <laughs> That's right. The, there's a PVC privacy wall on the right side as you enter the hot tub from the porch, and the cover for the hot tub lifts away from the porch and provides another privacy shade when lifted. There's some photos. Oh, I guess. I, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. This isn't going straight up. It's tilted. It's really not lifted. It's tilted. Okay, whatever. Well, yeah. Uh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Uh, but that cover can be fully removed if necessary, though. Mm. Okay. Mike would like to enter, be able to use a projector with and a Bluetooth speaker to provide entertainment while they are in the hot tub. He was thinking he could put a projector on a tripod and have it shine onto that PVC privacy wall. Okay. So the PVC privacy, privacy wall is a fence, right? No, it's flat. Yeah, it's it's a white. Okay, it's, it's a flat. it is a white surface. It's not huge, we have but it's yeah. yeah, yeah. We okay. Uh, blah, blah, blah. The image could be could only be a maximum of about three feet high, so the projector wouldn't need to create a huge image. But he wants it to be bright enough and super easy to set up and take down in the jiffy. He love it were truly portable, as in a as in battery powered. Uh, but are but there are outdoor outlets available, so you could run an extension cord to a tripod mounted uh, uh, projector if necessary. Do we have any suggestions for a suitable projector? His brother in law has an anchor nebula cosmos laser 4k projector which is two grand and that seems quite nice for this pur purpose so mike was considering the step down to the nebula mars 3 air which is a 600 model but he's open to suggestions um oh, crap i will say this i have to go i have to go i, okay. I can hear the dogs barking so i gotta, I gotta go check something i will say this uh, way too much trouble as far as I'm concerned, oh, okay. for what you're trying to do, I think that it's going to be too much, too much money, too expensive for the time. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know how much time you spend on a hot tub. I, I can't spend that much, but I would get a business class one, one of those itty bitty portable projectors, mm -hmm. and use that and skip the rest of this nonsense. But that's just okay. Go ahead. That, that's Tom's take on it. Um, so yeah, the uh, the Nebula series of projectors they are from Anchor, uh, and they they are pretty decent. Um, uh, that said, um, that that Mars Three Air, uh, six hundred dollars does come with a battery built in. Uh, 400 lumens is is where it's rated and you don't actually get you know measured 400 lumens out of that thing like just like uh, you know all projectors uh, it's it's always a bit lower than that it it would be a touch on the dim side um, I'm a little bit concerned about that now what I'm going to suggest is not uh, vastly brighter but it's a little bit brighter uh, in its place at a, a pretty similar price point um, yeah I mean if you can if, if you want a bright image then going for one that plugs in and what I'm going to uh, suggest a, a slightly different brand um, uh, has a plug-in model as well uh, but yeah obviously the price goes up a bit there 
Uh, but what I'm going to suggest to you is uh, BenQ uh, has has really quite similar projector offerings. They have their GS50, which is also a 1080p uh, battery powered uh, projector, very much like, like that Nebula Mars 3 Air, but it is a bit brighter, rated at 500 lumens uh, output instead of 400. Uh, but the actual visual brightness of the image, uh, particularly when you're in sort of the outdoor hot tub situation, it, it, it is a bit of a nicer uh, projector model. Now, they're selling it for $800, but it comes for $800 with a 100-inch Elite uh, Screens Yardmaster outdoor screen. I know we didn't mention about screens just yet, and he was talking about putting it onto the privacy wall, but these uh, uh, little teaser for coming up ahead, he's considering that he might get a screen as well, so there could definitely be the easy value there, which is that if you're going to end up getting projector and screen anyway, then that $800 price point versus the 600 for the Nebula, a little bit brighter, uh, I think a little bit nicer. The colors are definitely more accurate on the BenQ, and the price isn't wildly different, and the form factor and the battery power are about the same. Now, if you do have the option of plugging it in, uh, here's where BenQ's GP100, which is very similar form factor, but just a plug-in version of it instead, uh, but gets twice as bright, easily gets twice as bright as that by being able to plug it into the wall, but the price stays the same, $800. You don't get a screen along with it, so, you know, it's not literally the exactly the same price, but if you're not going to buy the screen anyway, and $800 was acceptable to you, I like the BenQ's just a little bit better than those Nebula ones. The price is not drastically different. The form factor is very, very similar, very easy to set up and they, they like literally have handles for carrying them around so uh they're, they're clearly meant to be uh you know quickly taken inside and out and they do have the tripod mount that you're looking for okay so they see guys gotta come in the house okay. uh he was trying to do everything from outside but he's gotta come inside so i'm going to go oh and all right yeah i'm just not gonna sit here and have the dogs howling that's on too and bad. off this entire okay. time and so i'm gonna go that was unplanned but can, i'll carry on in your stead soldier on Rob. that's what i shall do the royal right. rob you will get you'll get your direct information for the royal rob without me having to interject my <laughs> off the cuff imp i so see well everybody enjoy. wish tom well good luck in all your repairs we'll catch you next week tom <laughs> <sighs> Okie doke, so here I am carrying on on my lonesome, uh, but that's okay. We have uh, one more part uh, carrying on here from Mike's series of questions about the outdoor projector setup. So um, he does say if they are entertaining and they want a larger screen size outside. So yeah, uh, when we're looking at uh, what he has there um, for the setup with that, you know, just projecting onto the privacy wall that he was planning to do there, uh, basically because the privacy wall is only about three feet high, you'd end up with about a 70 inch screen size, which which look, if you're if you're sitting in the hot tub and then looking right beside you at a 70 inch screen, that's not going to seem too small at all. So that's totally fine. Uh, but he's just saying, you know, if um, they do decide they take that cover off of the hot tub, they set up a uh, you know self standing outdoor screen uh, on the rest of the patio there. What might we recommend for that? So. First of all, that's where, hearkening back, if you get the one, uh, the BenQ that comes with the 100-inch Elite Screens Yard Master Screen, that's a that's a perfect solution right there. Um, and it all comes in a bundle there for $800. Uh, that said, if 92 inches is large enough for you, only slightly smaller than the 100-inch screen, and you want an even easier, quicker, faster setup and takedown, uh, still sticking with Elite Screens, but they have their pop-up cinema screens. I've mentioned these on the podcast before, but they're a great solution for this when you really want to be able to quickly put up and take down a projection screen um and yeah minimal fuss you know comes with a carrying bag uh really easy to tote around so <laughs> excuse me 150 dollars uh gets you the 92 inch pop-up screen size so if you do get one of the projector models that doesn't come with a screen bundled with it that would be a fantastic option and i think suits all of your needs doesn't break the bank and uh yeah made that one pretty easy there Okay, so carrying on, uh, Jim is trying to con uh, conceptually and intuitively understand subwoofer equalization a little bit better. Uh, he gets how the dimensions of any given room result in standing waves and certain specific frequencies uh, at, or sorry, at certain specific frequencies. Uh, so if the wavelength or multiples of that wavelength uh, of a given frequency, they perfectly fit within the dimensions of a room, then they are always going to double up or cancel out when they reflect back and forth between two parallel surfaces. So if you're 
uh, situated right in uh, an area where they're doubling up, it's going to be you know much much louder. If you're situated right in an area where they're canceling out, it's going to be uh, essentially silence. And he understands how that works when you're talking about fixed wavelengths of a given frequency that you know mathematically fit perfectly within uh, given dimensions of a room between two parallel surfaces. Uh, so then from there he can understand how other frequencies are going to result in different peaks and dips depending on where you happen to be sitting in the room. And from that, he can, you know, intuitively understand that if you have multiple subwoofers spread out around the room, you're creating more variation in the peaks and dips at any given moment at any given location. So depending on where you're sitting or standing in the room, everything just sort of evens out by having multiple sources of bass all playing uh, at the same time spread around the room. But then he's wondering if you go to equalize your subwoofer output, uh, isn't your room correction program only going to capture whatever peaks and dips happen to occur right in the spots where you put the microphone and take the measurements? And then if that's the case, like let's say the mic picks up uh, you know, a big hump at 60 hertz right at the spot where you take the measurement, so it's gonna go and use the equalization to cut down 60 hertz right at the signal level it's, it's outputting 60 hertz quieter now at the signal level before it even reaches your subwoofers. Wouldn't that mean that in all the other locations in the room where you didn't happen to put the microphone and measure a hump at 60 hertz, now 60 hertz is actually going to be too quiet everywhere else. Um, so yes, conceptually, that is exactly correct. Uh, if, if you took a single measurement, right? You just put the microphone in one location and you took your measurement there and that's all you used to create your equalization curve, uh, you would absolutely end up in the situation where anywhere other than that single microphone location, uh, you are going to have some of the bass being too loud now and some of the bass being too quiet because we've equalized for that single microphone location. This is exactly the reason why room correction programs like Odyssey and Dirac and, you know, uh, Arc Genesis from Anthem or Trinov or, you know, any of the other more sophisticated uh, room correction programs, why they have you measure in multiple locations, not just a single microphone location, and then add some together those measurements to create a spatial average, right? So... It's making the assumption to a certain degree that by measuring in multiple microphone locations, you aren't going to have identical response at every microphone location, but we're going to say, okay, in mic location one, we measured a hump at 60 hertz and a dip at 70 hertz, you know, just as an example, but then in microphone locations two and six or something like that, we didn't measure the same hump at 60 hertz and the same dip at 70 hertz. Maybe it was completely inverted, or maybe it was just less than, or maybe it was more than or whatever, but we sum together all of those different microphone measurements, uh, you know, add them all together to create one summed together response, uh, and then say, okay, we're going to be able to equalize that. And, and the end result is if you have large variations from spot to spot, the equalization ends up doing very little. Because once you sum it all together, it's going to say, okay, well, I can't make you know, microphone position one substantially better without making microphone position two and microphone position five or whatever it is substantially worse and the equalization ends up doing very little. So this is precisely why uh, the approach that Tom and I espouse all the time is attempting to get as uniform a response in your base across at least like a three seater couch or you know the seats that you care about seats that are way over to the side or pressed right against a back wall sorry you're going to get a compromised response but we're going to pick like you know basically three main seats that we care about and try to achieve very uniform response across those three seats not necessarily linear and perfectly accurate to the signal to begin with, but just uniform. So if there is a hump at 60 hertz, there's a hump at 60 hertz in all three of those seats, all three of those main seats that we care about. We want that uniformity across our seats. And really the only way to achieve that is by having more than one bass producing thing in your room, at, you know, at least dual subwoofers, potentially even more if you have an irregularly shaped room or a non-enclosed room, that type of thing. But that's our goal is to get that uniformity across the seats. Now the equalization program and your multiple microphone measurements can all agree. They'll say, okay, it doesn't matter where I put the microphone anywhere on this three-seater couch. I'm measuring a hump at 60 hertz. So I can go ahead and 
equalize that, I can lower that in the signal level, now it sounds correct in all three of those seats that I care about because all three of those seats are producing uniform results. That could result in a seat way over to the side of the room now being too quiet at 60 hertz. That is that is entirely possible. Or the seats that are pressed right up against your back wall, maybe they're too quiet at 60 hertz. Yeah, we've we've reduced the signal level. Uh, you know, we've reduced the actual electrical signal level. And so it is going to be playing quieter at 60 hertz. But if we have uniformity and a uniform hump across the main seats that we care about, then we've we've achieved our goal of having at least the primary seats in the theater getting good response uh, because they are uniform across all of them and therefore we can equalize effectively. So I hope conceptually that makes sense now. Okay, let's move on to Eric. Eric has been wanting to buy a 55-inch TV that is dedicated to gaming with his PlayStation 5. It'll go in his converted garage theater, uh, and it's separate from his projection setup. So it's completely light-controlled in there. He'll almost certainly only be gaming at night anyway. So basically he's saying, yeah, uh, reflections, glare, light coming into the theater, that's not a concern for this television. Uh, he doesn't want to spend a ton, even $1,000 seems a bit steep, and he'd uh, really like to be able to take full advantage of everything his PlayStation 5 can do, so that's up to 4K resolution at 120 frames per second with variable refresh rate, HDR, all of those things, HDMI 2.1 bandwidth is uh, what he is after. So he went over to Artings Ratings, looked up their suggestions that they have their suggested TVs for the PlayStation 5, went down to their pick for the sort of price range that he's looking at. And uh, for those purposes at that price point, they suggested Hisense's U7K. Uh, it came to the top of their recommendation list, and he also has heard us, uh, me, I know I have recommended that specific model. So he was like, oh, perfect. Seems like there's agreement here. He was about ready to buy. But now on this very podcast and elsewhere there have been sort of these warnings from people about Hisense's lack of long-term reliability uh you know Hisense TVs uh having issues just after the one-year warranty expires that type of thing and how their quality control and their customer service seem to be kind of poor so a friend warned him away from Hisense after bad experience that friend also pointed him to a Reddit thread where people were listing all the reasons why ratings is wrong about uh putting that U7 K from Hisense at the top of their value list for the PlayStation 5. So do we feel confident telling him to ignore all of that, all of those warnings, just go ahead and get the Hisense uh, U7K anyway, or is there a better recommendation that we can offer that doesn't have so many worries about reliability and customer support? Um, so look, I feel perfectly happy if you're like a little bit leery of Hisense and I don't have enough personal experience, long-term usage of any Hisense products uh, to really weigh in on that on a personal level. And e even if I did, that would be purely anecdotal, but it'd be a sampling of one of myself. Uh, but yes, there, there do seem to be sort of rumblings just generally online about people not super happy about Hisense's customer support, um, you know, long-term reliability. And look, that's not unusual with a value brand that is em uh, entering a new market, trying to undercut everybody on price. Corners have to get cut somewhere. Uh, this is a, a tune we're familiar with. Vizio is still fighting that perception because when they came into the market and undercut everybody on price, people were complaining about their reliability and their customer service, and that has dogged them to this day, even though they've made a lot of efforts to uh, turn around and change that. So I can't say it's a surprise in any way that Hisense is, is uh, you know, getting that same sort of reputation. So I can turn around and say TCL generally has quite a good repu uh, reputation. People have praised their customer support, uh, saying that they have been responsive and that they have made efforts to help them out if anything goes wrong. Uh, the reports of their reliability have not had the negative connotations uh, that Hisenses has. So, you know, TCL by all outward appearance, anecdotally, seems to be doing things right, and they most definitely have a uh, you know exceedingly competitive model with that U7K. In fact, they have a 7 in their model number 2, and that would just be the Q7 or Q750G series that is readily available. Get it at Best Buy, get it at Amazon, get it at Costco. Uh, he was talking about 55 to 65 inches. So right now it's not on sale and the 55 inches, $600, the 65 inches, $800. So we're certainly under that $1,000 price threshold. It's, you know, very much equivalent to that U7K in almost every performance metric. The one thing was, you know, when I've observed the U7K, I liked that screen finish a little bit better, but... 
I liked it a little bit better because it was it, it just reduced reflections in that the reflections weren't as visible and it um, if you're in a well lit situation uh, just the, the the general look of the black of the screen didn't you know r- rise uh, to sort of a lighter gray shade uh, the TCL Q7 or Q750G it's the same thing but uh, you know that that one I thought the screen finish wasn't quite as nice but in a dark environment like what you're talking about saying you're only really going to be gaming on it at night fully light controlled environment anyway we're not so worried about reflections and we're not so worried about high ambient light and the black level rising uh just from that so i think go with a q7 i think you'll feel more comfortable with it um i certainly wouldn't have a problem with anybody still purchasing a high sense u7k but given that there's such an easy alternative to recommend i say go with a q7 series from tcl and i think you'll be happy with that all right pause for a moment as i take a drink of water because i don't have tom to cover for me Okay, let's carry on with another question here from Bill. Uh, when Bill bought his house, the previous owner had already installed a 110-inch acoustically transparent screen. So Bill just kept that. He doesn't know the brand or model of that 110-inch screen. Unfortunately, the screen recently got damaged. He's like, yep. It was a kid, that's as much as he'll say. <laughs> so he's now in need of a replacement. Uh, the space uh, is available on that wall to go with a larger screen size. So he's like, yeah, I could go as large as 125 inches and he would be happy to go with the screen size upgrade uh, since he has to replace that screen anyway. So he's using an Epson 5040 UB projector and they watch movies in total darkness or TV with the dim lights in the room. So he's just like, which acoustically transparent screen would we recommend? Uh, So I'm going to go in descending order of price. uh, And in this case, uh, I sort of feel that um, you you do get a little bit uh, better quality performance at the higher price point. I'm not going way far afield here, uh, but I'm going to start with Seymour AV. They make our absolute favorite acoustic, uh, acoustically transparent screens, uh, but at this sort of screen size, uh, theirs is actually going to be 122 inches. Uh, Seymour does all of their sizes by the width of the screen, so you end up with some sort of uh, slightly atypical diagonals, but uh, it ends up being a 122-inch screen size, which should fit uh, in the space that you described. Um, with their precision frame, which is their less expensive frame option, that is going to be $1,550, uh, $1,550 uh, to go for that size in their uh, acoustic transparent uh, XD screen material. I'm going to assume that with that screen size, you're sitting at least 10 feet away. Uh, so going with that uh, that XD material that they have, fantastic performance, stays nice and bright. It's pure white, but you've said, you know, movies are in total darkness, TV's in a dimly lit room. So uh, going with the white screen is absolutely what I would recommend there. Uh, so yeah, that, that would be my favorite one from a, from a sheer performance standpoint. The build quality on the frame is tremendous. It's absolutely excellent. Uh, Seymour has my favorite method of attaching the screen material to the frame, which is just like uh, O-rings uh, that you stretch uh, onto hooks on the frame uh so i like that the best but there's no question that that price point 1550 dollars is a little bit on the high side so coming down to a lower price point uh i guess probably my second favorite in acoustically transparent screens is elite screens acoustic pro uhd i want to stress that the acoustic pro uhd is kind of the only fabric that I really, really like from Elite Screens. They have other acoustically transparent fabrics available, but specifically Acoustic Pro UHD is the one that I like to recommend. Uh, Standard screen sizes here, so it's going to be 120 inches from Elite Screens for their Aeon frame with the Acoustic Pro UHD uh, acoustically transparent material. Again, regular white uh, finish on that. Not quite as high, again, not quite as bright as the reflection you'll get from the Seymour AV uh, screen material. But still a really good performance and you're never going to see any holes or anything in it or anything like that. And the acoustic transparency is very good. So $975 gets you the 120 inch screen size. So yeah, we've, we've definitely reduced the price there. If that's still too expensive, uh, my next option doesn't get a whole lot less expensive, but it's still a bit less expensive and that might make all the difference. So Silver Ticket, uh, always love the value for their screens. They have a woven acoustically transparent material as well. Comes with a black backing, standard screen 
screen sizes again, so 120 inches is available at $819. Uh, so that's going to be about as inexpensive as you can get for a screen that I would highly recommend. Nice frame here. Um, the way that you attach the screen material is just uh, uh, um, sort of like a metal rod that goes along each edge of the screen and then just uh, sort of hooks into these little plastic clips that are secured to the uh, frame edges there. So not really my absolute favorite method of attaching a uh, screen material but you know still gets the job done it's the lowest price that you can get still good performance there so yeah various price points one of those should you do the job for you so hopefully that uh, recommendation comes in handy Okie doke. Let's move on to Jay. He is uh, near the Toronto area in Ontario, Canada. So Jay is really bummed out. Uh, it's been three years of trials and tribulations putting together his home theater. He finally like, got the room completed, got his room treatments put up, hung on the walls. He was excited to run Odyssey for the first time, dial everything in, finally get going and enjoy all of his hard work. But then uh, he goes ahead, he powers everything on, uh, prepares preparing to go through the Odyssey process, and he discovers that in that front left tower at the front of the room, there is a constant buzz coming out of it. It's not crazy loud. He sent a video, uh, you know, demonstrating it, but yeah, there's just this constant buzz. It is clearly audible. It's not like just a, a uh, standard noise floor hiss where you have to basically press your ear against the tweeter to hear it. No, this is like a, it's a buzz. Uh, it's not a 60 hertz hum, like a ground loop uh, electrical interference. It's just like this buzzing uh, coming out basically from the tweeter of that speaker. So he's got all three of his front speakers being powered by separate outlaw audio model 2200 monoblock amplifiers so he's got three of these monoblock amplifiers one connected to each of his front three speakers so he went ahead and tried all the troubleshooting that he could think of on his own. He swapped RCA cables. He swapped power cables. Uh, he tried the different amp channels because he's got the three identical monoblock amplifiers. So he called Outlaw's customer support and they spent about 10 minutes with him on the phone going through all of that troubleshooting over again. And the problem follows one of those monoblock amplifiers. The other two monoblock amplifiers are totally fine. All of the cables are fine. All of the speakers are fine. But yeah, there is one amplifier. Doesn't matter which uh, wires or speaker he connects to that one amplifier, a buzz comes out of whatever speaker is connected. So there's something wrong with that amplifier. The issue is uh, Outlaw's customer support had no idea what the cause was. Uh, they said they've never actually had this exact problem with any model 2200 unit before, at least not the representative that he spoke to wasn't aware of any. So uh, he said in his email, Outlaw is, is you know willing to perform a repair, but he's out of warranty at this point. He'd have to ship it back to them. And since he's in Canada, it's a much more expensive proposition doing the cross-border shipping to and back. Uh, so he wanted to reach out to us here at AV Rant in the hopes that we might have some idea what is the cause and maybe there's an outside chance that there's a, a inexpensive fix or something he could do you know north of the border here in Canada uh, to, to do this less expensively so uh, from the video that he sent I listened to it and you know what it sounded exactly like uh, what I was hearing from my own ATI amplifier mine was a five channel amplifier when I bought it an AT1805 uh, but it was the exact same, just sort of constant buzzing that was like, it was clearly from the amplifier itself. Now, in the case of the ATI that I had, it was five separate amplifier blades inside of the chassis powered by two toroidal transformers uh, inside of the ATI that I have. And two of the amplifier channels were creating this constant buzzing, and three of them were performing exactly the way that they ought to. Uh, so when I contacted uh, ATI's customer service, they were like, yeah, our, our amps don't buzz. <laughs> so so they were rather insistent uh, that I that I ship it back to them and that they get a look at it and, uh, and fix whatever issue was going on there. So that similar situation, you know, I had to ship it cross-border to the US. Uh, there was a cost involved in that. Uh, but they reported back that one of those toroidal transformers uh, at some point, it wasn't when they first shipped it to me because it was working fine then, but I had moved apartments. And so, you know, at some point in that move, one of those toroidal transformers had become dislodged. Um, you know, it, it wasn't secured the way that it should be. And I'm not exactly sure the electrical reason why a dislodged toroidal transformer resulted in a buzz coming out of the two amplifier blades that that particular 
toroid was uh, powering because the the other the the two toroidal uh, power supplies inside of the chassis there one of them is powering two of the blades and one of them was powering three of the blades three of the blades working perfectly fine and that toroidal transformer perfectly fine but the second toroidal transformer had become slightly dislodged at some point when I had moved it and uh, it was creating this buzz of those two amplifier channels. So the inside of the Model 2200, the Outlaw, there's a big pancake toroidal transformer. It's, it is a toroidal transformer, but it's very, very flat so that it fits in the uh, the shape of the chassis that they use for that Model 2200. Um, you know, I, I would have to hazard a guess that at some point, like, you know, it's been years that he's been putting this theater together. I imagine those amplifiers have been moved around at some points that that it it sounds <laughs> like it could be a similar situation where, where that pancake toroidal transformer got slightly dislodged or misaligned or there's a wire slightly loose connection inside something along those lines um so i would expect that this is something that is repairable by outlaw i i would simply you know just inquire straight up what is the shipping price to them and back to me gonna be uh, uh assuming that it is a, just a dislodged uh transformer that needs to be you know properly secured back back in its place uh you know what sort of price that would be if that's all going to cost more than just buying a new replacement amplifier within canada or having one shipped into canada then you know there there's your cost benefit ratio as to what makes sense but i i certainly would inquire about what that uh, uh what the shipping price and what the expected uh repair cost might be uh get a ballpark figure on that and if it's less than buying a new amplifier then you know the, the, there's no reason to expect that this is some sort of uh, like cascading problem that's going to affect your other uh, amplifiers as well. I, I suspect that it's the same thing that happened to my ATI. Uh, so he says, if a repair is not possible or it is simply too expensive, do we have any suggestions for replacement amps that wouldn't cost an arm and a leg to get in Canada? Uh, so I will say Emotiva uh, has definitely improved like this is years ago that they did this but their their shipping into canada is a much smoother process than years and years ago um you can you just do it all on their online website uh, or give them a call sometimes you're able to get a little bit of a, a discounted price if you uh, do it over the phone uh, but a very simple process for shipping into canada that said if you get their most direct replacement which would be the uh, base x a1 monoblock amplifier it's sort of a one-for-one -one replacement for that model 2200 uh, if you just go by the order it through their website and have the landed shipping cost all included it comes to 819 canadian dollars uh and then whatever tax uh, ontario tax on top of that too so not exactly cheap um but then again if you just paid the 400 us dollar price plus the conversion plus the shipping costs to bring a brand new one into canada i think it would actually be slightly less than that after the conversion but it's it's not you know, miles apart in terms of price range. So kind of comparable there, whether you just bought a whole new model 2200 from Outlaw or whether you ordered one from Emotiva, pretty similar price points there. So what I can point you to, uh, it's not going to be a monoblock amplifier because uh, I don't see any listed as available, but Summit Hi-Fi, uh, they are in Canada. They, they're selling in Canada. There is a Summit Hi-Fi USA uh, version that uh, if you're uh, in the US and ordering from Summit Hi-Fi, you can do it there. But Summit Hi-Fi is based in Canada and uh, they import Tone Winner uh, brand amplifiers from China. Now, the OEM on those is as far as I can tell, it's Jade Designs, which is the same OEM that's behind Emotiva. Uh, so really, really similar, solid amplifier designs there, but I don't see a monoblock uh, tone winner uh, offering that you can get from Summit Hi-Fi in Canada. Um, so yeah, Jay was mentioning that, oh, he might just get like a five-channel amp, like uh, Outlaw's, uh, you know, Model 5000X. Anyway, that, that was on his mind anyway. So there is like a great tone, wi tone winner equivalent. It's like very much the equivalent of Emotiva's BaseX A5 five-channel amplifier 100 watts times five channels into eight ohms and you can get that for 700 dollars canadian from summit hi-fi which is a, a better price than you're going to get on any of the five by 100 watt uh amplifiers that you might import from uh, emotiva or outlaw or any other brands so that's certainly an option going with tone winner from summit hi-fi but i would get back on the horn with outlaw see what can be done see what the pricing is really going to be Okay, let's move on to our next question asker, which is Raph. Uh, Raph is living in Australia. Uh, his theater room is about 13 feet wide by about 19 and a half feet long, and he's using a Denon X8500H receiver uh, to power just a five-speaker setup at the moment, 5.4 setup. He's got four subwoofers. So his five speakers are all from the brand VAF, which is available in Australia there. Uh, he's got five of the speakers from the Signature 
Witcher series. Uh, he likes their coaxial driver design. He's just a fan of that. He's happy with their sound. Uh, and then his four subwoofers that he's using are all, uh, all from the brand R-E-L, REL. Uh, he's using four of their HT-1205 subwoofers. He put two at the front of the room, two at the back of the room. That's fantastic. That is definitely the way to position four subwoofers. So he would like to expand his system now by adding four overhead speakers. Uh, certainly no problem on a processing side doing that with his existing Denon X8500H receiver. And he's heard so much about how great the Oro 3D Oromatic upmixer is online that he's very eager to give it a try, uh, even more so than Atmos and DTS-X or their upmixers. He's like really keen to try the Oromatic upmixer. Um, I've said all along, I, like, I, I think it sounds good. I think it's quite simple <laughs> what the Oromatic upmixer is doing. It's not a particularly complicated thing uh, that it's doing to the sound, but it, it does sound good. It sounds perfectly reasonable. Basically, it just has a bit of high frequency roll off and a very slight delay on the signal to give the uh, sensation of being in a physically larger room where you'd have a little bit of reverb and that high frequency roll off from sounds emanating from a little bit farther away than your physical walls are actually placed. And it does a good job of mimicking that. I'm I'm certainly not as over the moon about the aromatic up mixer. I, I, I don't think it's it's really anything spectacular in my opinion, but it, it does sound good. And, and since it's already built into your X8500H, why not give it a try? I certainly have no problem with that. Try all the upmixers, try all the Atmos and DTSX. Uh, it's all going to be there for you to do with your four overhead speakers. So regardless of all of that, uh, wedge-shaped height speakers would work best in his setup, just physically. That would be nicest to set up. And of course, if he is eyeing Oro more than uh, Dolby or DTS, you know, they want height speakers instead. But I, I have no beef using height speakers as your overheads. That, that certainly makes sense to me. So he considered VAF's own sort of cube-shaped smaller speakers, since they use the same tweeter and the driver materials as the rest of his uh, VAF speakers that he already has. But those cube shaped ones are kind of pricey and they aren't web shaped, uh, uh, wedge shaped. So, you know, for height speakers, he's like, yeah, that seems like a bit of overkill, particularly on the price there. So he went looking for other coaxial speaker options and of course came across CAF. Uh, in their Q series, they have their Q50A, which is, you know, one of those wedge shaped uh, Atmos speakers can be used up firing or it can be used mounted on your wall up high. So uh, he was just wondering, do we think those would match nicely enough with his VA? F speakers, and then also, do we think it would be of a benefit to him, uh, like in terms of lowering the noise floor um, or just, you know, overall better performance in some way by adding some uh, amplification to his X8500H, say, like a five channel Emotiva uh, Base X A5 as an example? So, uh, yeah, I'll answer those questions in the order that they came in there. Um, the Q50A uh, KEF speakers. Very neutral speakers, um, you know, with any other neutral speakers, particularly as overhead height effects speakers, uh, I would have no qualms about their timbre match or anything else like that. If you're just a fan of coaxial speaker designs, then absolutely going with Kef makes all the sense in the world. Widely available, not crazy expensive, less expensive than getting a pair of the VAF, uh, VAF speakers that aren't even wedge shaped. So yeah, all of that makes sense to me. I am not familiar enough with VAF. I've never heard them. So I don't know if they have some sort of characteristic sound that they target. I don't know if they purposely color the sound, uh, go for a specific frequency response that is not perfectly linear and, and neutral. Uh, I don't know if that's the case. Uh, but if they are going for a more or less neutral, transparent to the signal type of sound, then yeah, the KEFs are going to match with that perfectly fine, uh, especially for height speakers where it's really not critical. <laughs> really, really not critical. How good your overhead speakers are as long as they're anywhere close to competent. It's going to be perfectly fine for height speakers. So uh, I feel pretty confident that you'll be very happy with those KEF uh, Q50A uh, wedge-shaped speakers. Uh, I see very few scenarios where that's going to be a disappointment going with those. And then... Would you benefit from uh, adding some external amplification? Honestly, in your room size, with the X8500H, I'm going to say no. With the X8500H, uh, it's so clean in its amplification. Uh, it's got so much power available on tap, and you're in a, a 13 by 19 and a half foot room. You know, you're, you're on the low end of a medium-sized room. Uh, uh, you really just... You just don't need it. You know, in, in, a, in a genuinely blind listing comparison... 
I, I don't see how you would ever audibly notice the difference uh, between just using the x8500h's built-in amplifiers for all nine speakers in this setup uh versus offloading five of them to uh to an ebotiva amplifier um yeah my claim is that there's there's no benefit to be had here just just added cost and added complexity to your system more wires <laughs> and, and i don't think you need to do it at all all right i need another sip of water here otherwise my throat's gonna get too dry Okie doke. Let's carry on with Henry here. Uh, Henry tends to upgrade his projectors fairly frequently. Uh, he's gone from an Epson 5040UB several years ago to a JVC NX5, and now he's got a JVC NP5. So some really nice projectors that he's had all along there. And uh, yeah, upgraded those every few years or so. Uh, all of those projector models offer motorized lens shift. So with all three, he has come across an issue where he, you know, he's like, yeah, self-admittedly, he spent way too much time up on a ladder, carefully adjusting the roll, pitch, and yaw of his projector ceiling mount, and then carefully adjusting the lens shift to perfectly align the image on his screen. He doesn't want to miss a single pixel. Uh, so he's like, yeah, that's great. He does all that. He watches a movie. Everything's fine. He's happy. But then turns the projector off, comes back the next day. 24 hours later, 22 hours later, if it was a two-hour movie, he turns it back on and he discovers that the image has physically shifted just a little bit, always down. He's always noticed that the, uh, the image has uh, shifted down just a little bit. Uh, he says typically by about a quarter of an inch. So obviously that's like a tiny movement physically of the lens itself on the projector that's going to be magnified many, many times by the time it hits the screen and it's only a, a quarter of an inch that it's moved on the screen. But it's like he wants perfection. <laughs> it's like he spent all that time on the ladder dialing it in perfectly. Why can't it just stay still? So he's tried selecting the lens lock setting in the projector's menu, but that just locks out the ability to, you know, use the motorized controls on the remote to move the lens shift around it's it's never helped as far as it just seemingly to physically sag in some way while the projector is off overnight so he's looked around and folks on the forums have reported that you know he's not the only one that this has happened to it seems to be kind of a fairly common occurrence uh people speculate that it's you know due to the heat right the projector's heating up uh stays hot during the movie and then cools back down and it's just the expansion and contraction of the materials uh leads to that lens you know just sort of sort of sagging just a uh, little bit overnight there so he's just like can we chime in what's going on is there a way to prevent this slight sagging of the motorized lens position so he doesn't have to readjust it every time that he fires up his projector and uh yeah just to reiterate it only ever shifts down it doesn't shift up it doesn't shift to either side so it seems to just be like literally like a gravity problem or something like that um so yeah this is this is not uncommon uh it's not just the motorized ones either sometimes uh you know uh projectors that just have manual uh lens shift control uh yeah there, there can be this little bit of movement i mean it's why typically <laughs> when we set up a projector we set it up with some overscan uh, right where where some of the 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 very edges of the image are spilling over onto the frame of the screen at the top on the sides and the bottom too right that little bit of overscan that's why we want that really nice light absorbent uh, black velvet frame around our screen so that we can have that little bit of overscan going on the screen and then if there's a little shift in any direction but you know any a little bit of shift in the image um, you know that that uh, that that isn't a problem now what I would ask is so like he's adjusting it right he's, he's he's going in there fixing it every time so that it's pixel perfect comes back the next day and it shifted down if you just like left it the way that you found it right like you you find it it shifted down by that quarter of an inch up at the screen um if you just left it there and then if you came back the next day again would it have shifted down another quarter inch or would it basically have stayed the same? Because if this is sort of like a uh, anything to do with the little worm gears that are turning inside with that motorized lens shift, if this is like a heat issue expanding, contracting or whatever, I'm like, if it just settles, if it settles to a position, then, you know, this is going to be, in your case, if you're wanting pixel perfection, uh, a lot of very annoying trial and error, but it would be like, you know, the obvious case of you actually just adjust it so that it's a quarter inch too high, 
You run the projector, you let it cool down, you come back the next day, it's now done its typical sagged by a quarter of an inch, but now if it settles there and doesn't move again another quarter of an inch the following day, then we've sort of, you know, solved the issue that way. Uh, Look, the real answer is we've got to get away from wanting pixel perfection on a projector. It's exceedingly difficult to obtain anyway, and do we honestly care if we're missing, like, five pixels around the edge of each image? There isn't crucial information in any movie or tv show that's like the last five pixels of the edge of the screen we can quite safely overshoot that onto the frame without actually losing anything important to the story uh you know uh, or the artistry of any movie or tv show i suppose if you're you know using it as a mission critical computer display uh maybe you have something in the last pixel on the edge of your screen but that doesn't seem to be the scenario that you're talking about here so that's one suggestion is that we actually you know start by adjusting it too high the image lens shifted a little bit too high let it do its sag and if it settles there then we're okay I mean, about the only other thing you can really do there is is fashion some sort of, you know, physical little splint that you put into that little gap between the lens and the the uh, housing, the projector housing, and, and just like physically shim it into place, and then it won't shift. Uh, but of course, that's going to be a whole bunch of trial and error too, and then, you know, got to be very careful because if you ever do go and use that motorized lens and the shim is still in place yeah you're going to hear some horrible grinding and that's going to be a scary situation so i'm not super in favor of that um but yeah the real answer and i know the answer that tom would be giving you if you were here is this is a mental exercise more than it is a physical exercise with your projector um you basically have to get used to what almost everyone else does with their projector and just get used to a little bit of a little bit of overscan, a little bit of overshoot, a little bit of light spill onto the uh, frame of your projector. Okay, let's see. I'm getting close to two hours here, but I'm going to try and get in at least one more here. Dan, Dan has a dedicated enclosed theater room. It is 3,500 cubic feet in air volume. Uh, so yeah, that's... Uh, Smack dab in the middle side. No, no, that's getting getting towards large size room. There, that's yeah, upper end of medium size room. Anyway, at the moment he has a pair of HSU VTF2 Mark V subs in there, and he tends to typically listen with the master volume set to about minus ten or minus twenty. So one day, while everybody else was out of the house, he turned his system up to zero dB full reference volume, and he watched Gunpowder Milkshake off of Netflix, and the bass became like visceral in a way that he doesn't normally experience, and now he wants to have that experience more often. So would a subwoofer upgrade be useful in his theater or is there simply no way to get that visceral bass experience without forcing all of his family members to leave the house so that he can enjoy it at that volume level um yeah i mean what you experienced was increased sound pressure and i mean like if you got a subwoofer that is capable of playing even louder than your hsu vtf2 mark fives it's not like it's inherently increasing the sound pressure unless you turn the volume up like that that that's all there is to it and i mean the thing was you were able to reach that performance level with the vtf2 mark 5s for the cubic footage that you specified in an enclosed room they're like they're they're just right right they're they're they're, they're sort of reaching their limits right as you reach full reference volume so you could have even more headroom if you wanted to go louder than reference volume, uh, you know, that than even la- a larger, more powerful subwoofers way that you do that. But it's really not a requirement. You you have no particular need to upgrade your subwoofers to more powerful subwoofers. You're you're you've got a really nice match between output capability of your current subs and the room size that you have. They're like they're like a perfect match right there. Uh, and then yeah, if you want to have that visceral experience, that that is just sheer sound pressure, and there's nothing you can do other than turning the volume up to that. So if turning the volume up to that level on a regular basis is not an option, but you want that greater visceral impact, that's where a tactile transducer solution might be for you, right? Adding my favorite tactile transducer solution, which is the butt kicker brand, butt kickers. And uh, whenever I recommend them, I'm like, yeah, you want to get the full size, the butt kicker LFE, not the butt kicker mini. You want to get the full size butt kicker LFE and do things right. That's the one that really delivers the, the more subtle experience where it's not like, oh, I am clearly having my sheet, uh, my seat shaken by some other thing. Uh, it, it is subtle and precise enough with that bucket or LFE to uh, trick you into thinking that, oh, that sensation, that physical sensation I'm having 
uh, through my body and through my seat is actually being generated by the speakers. You can dial in the butt kicker LFE uh, like that if, if you're careful with your setup. So that would be the solution there if you're not able to, you know, kick the family out on a regular basis and turn things up to full reference volume to have that experience. I would definitely consider in your case a uh, tactile transducer, a butt kicker LFE specifically. So continuing on with Dan, one reason he was thinking he'd be happy to do a subwoofer upgrade in the theater is because he has a soundbar set up in his open concept living room. It's a 20-year-old two-channel Yamaha soundbar with a subwoofer output built into it, and he's got that connected to a small infinity sub. So yes, we can see the wheels turning there, right? I upgrade the subwoofers in my theater, I can move my HSU subwoofers into the open concept living room. So the open concept living room is open to the dining room, the kitchen, a couple of, he says, big hallways and the stairs so like the rest of his house basically um so he's like hey if i did move my hsu subwoofers the pair of them into the living room would that be worthwhile and uh as it is that little infinity sub is hidden behind his tv sands so the pair of hsu subs would be a big change a big visual change in addition to a big audio change uh but if he could somehow manage it what would be the best practices for positioning to or even maybe he adds more gets four subwoofers in a wide open space like like this so uh look unless you go nuts <laughs> this this sounds like a big um, uh, volume of air you are not going to get reference volume in your open concept living room nor would you want to because if you actually had a sound pressure level of greater than 110 decibels pressurizing essentially your entire house uh yeah you think your family is upset when you turn your dedicated enclosed theater up to full reference volume yeah th there's no way they're having it <laughs> you know turning it up to greater than 110 decibels in the base in the open concept living room so uh that's just a goal that we need to get out of our heads uh obviously the vtf2 mark fives uh, and a pair of them at that are going to be able to play louder than your little infinity sub that you're using right now but is is loudness actually your issue, right? Like this is for casual TV watching. It's in the living room. You've been going along with a 20 year old Yamaha soundbar all this time. To me, it doesn't seem like literal volume level is the thing that you're after. You know, you're after a, a quality upgrade as, as far as I can tell. Now, could having a pair of nice subwoofers like the VTF2 Mark Vs deliver you a quality upgrade? Yeah, they certainly could. They they absolutely could. The the best practices here in in any space is that you simply want to have the subwoofers across the space from each other. Um, that's what we're always aiming for with any multiple subwoofers. Now, look, if you have two very obvious parallel surfaces. Uh, across the room from each other. Like, you know, it's an irregularly shaped room. It's open to the rest of the house, but the front wall and the back wall are very obviously parallel to one another. Then that's where you're going to, you, you, you can very reliably predict that there is going to be a standing wave that sets up between those two parallel walls. So that's where you're going to want to have a sub on the front wall, a sub on the back wall, if that is the two parallel surfaces, or if it's the two side walls that are parallel, you're going to have a one, a sub on the left wall and a sub on the right wall. That's the sort of rule of thumb, easy, is is definitely going to address at least one standing wave in this space uh, approach that we always want to have with multiple subwoofers. But yeah, in general, we just want to spread them out. We want to spread them apart from each other. And then we could use something like the multi-sub optimizer software and a mini DSP 2x4 HD to optimize the individual settings for each sub if we get to that that side of things. Um, to me, it all sounds a little bit doubtful that you know subs as large and, and physically plain, let's say, if not downright unattractive as the VTF2 Mark Vs. I don't know if that's gonna fly in your living room, but yes, we can improve the quality, we can improve the uniformity, we can improve the overall response throughout the listening area by having two far more capable subwoofers. But yeah, in sheer volume, you're not reaching reference volume with those VTF5 Mark v, uh, VTF2 Mark Vs, but I, there certainly could be a worthwhile audible upgrade to be had. So 
He'd really like to upgrade that 20-year-old Yamaha soundbar, uh, but it's going to have to remain a soundbar in form factor that goes uh, with the TV in the living room. There's no wiggle room on that decision. Uh, they also are a Google household. They have the, the Google Home system, voice assistant, uh, going on throughout the house, and the Yamaha soundbar doesn't play with the Google system. It's 20 years old. That's before the Google Assistant existed, so uh, he really likes something that does. Uh, he'd still like to have a dedicated subwoofer output in case he does manage to move his pair of HSU subs or a pair of different subs into the living room at some point uh, but then he also wants the whole setup to sound nice for background music uh, but then also for watching casual tv for watching sports so uh, yeah uh, I'll address the uh, soundbar question first and he's got a, another question coming up um, this is a little bit tricky i'd like to have a less expensive option to point you to uh, but the subs that do every or the sound bars rather that do everything that you asked for so this is a somewhat suitable for this wide open size that you're dealing with b have a dedicated subwoofer output that you can connect any regular subwoofer to just a rca subwoofer out jack uh and then also work with the google uh home assistant um there, there, there is a solution, thankfully, that checks the boxes, and it's Sennheiser's Ambio series of sound bars. Right now, their uh, Ambio Plus uh, would be a good solution here. Um, I, I think form factor-wise, this is the one that has the better chance of fitting where your current Yamaha uh, fits uh, and just has uh, dedicated subwoofer output. It's colored in blue for some reason on the back of the uh, uh, Ambio Plus soundbar from Sennheiser. But yeah, th this checks all the boxes. The only downside is it is one thousand five hundred dollars it is not a cheap soundbar by any means but you're dealing with a large space you know that you're contending with that this isn't a, a rinky dink soundbar that's going to sound good in here you have some specific features that you want the soundbar to have working with the google assistant having the dedicated dedicated subwoofer output you can of course pair it with any of sennheiser's wireless uh soundbars that are meant to pair up with their their soundbars that's an option too but yeah you have just the regular rca out jack um Crutchfield does have like uh, open box models available for less than the $1,500 price. But yeah, it's a bit spendy. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of drivers going on inside of that uh, MBO Plus uh, soundbar from Sennheiser. It's not like you're getting nothing for that money. Some very sophisticated processing that's going on inside of it too. If you're like, I actually just want even bigger and louder, there is uh, Sennheiser's Ambio Soundbar Max. <laughs> it's it's big. It's a big honking boy. Uh, but it also has all those features, the, uh, the dedicated subwoofer output, the uh, working with uh, Google Home Assistant. Uh, goodles and oodles of drivers inside there. But this is a physically very large subwoofer, uh, soundbar rather, and it costs $2,500. Not cheap, uh, not small, uh, probably, I'm guessing, not the one that you would go for if you do this. But yeah, as far as checking all the boxes you asked for, uh, Sennheiser's Ambio soundbars are the solution there. Uh, Sony has some options that kind of come close, but they don't have the dedicated subwoofer output. So you'd be pairing them with one of Sony's own uh, wireless subs. As far as I'm aware, they do have the option of pairing with more than one at this point. You definitely want to get the SW5 if you go that route. But now the price, honestly, once you add, uh, say, so if you go for like uh, Sony's HT3000 uh, soundbar and pair it with, uh, you know, at least one uh, or, or two of those SW5 wireless Sony subwoofers, like you're, you're getting kind of close to the $1,500 price of the Sennheiser anyway. Now, of course, the Sennheiser at $1,500 isn't coming with any subwoofers, but you already own the subwoofers that you might use. So um, yeah, uh, value-wise and, and to check all the features, then, you know, Sennheiser's Ambio soundbars might be the way to go for you. Uh, I, I hesitate to uh, recommend a soundbar that expensive, but you have some specific needs and they... They will do what you need them to do. Uh, so lastly, uh, he says, you know, can we discuss how to set up a subwoofer in an open concept space like his living room and have it work well both at low volume when you just want background music and you want to be able to talk to people and not have it be a distraction, but then also still provide some slam when you're watching sports and TV shows. Um, that is actually where the dual or more than dual subwoofer setup becomes uh, sort of critical, right? 
Because if what you're talking about is, I want to have it on at a fairly low volume in the background, but I want to be able to walk around this open living uh, space, uh, talk to people wherever I, I might be situated. When you have the single subwoofer, you're going to have that very uneven response that we talked about from place to place. Some spots at some frequencies are going to get crazy loud. You're going to be like, how can even that little infinity sub sound that loud when I'm this far away from it? Why is it just like, blaring and 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 booming to the point that I can't hold a conversation well it's 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 a specific frequency at a specific location in that room where that can happen but it's it's gonna happen somewhere at some point at some frequency and similarly you're gonna get to some spots where it's like all the bass just disappears it, it's just gone um and that's just cancellations that are happening at that particular location in the room so that's where multiple subwoofers are going to even out that response a lot better so that yeah, when it's when it's quieter, it's just it's at that level everywhere, no matter where you're walking, no matter where you're talking, no matter what song is playing, no matter what the frequency is, it's just that much more even, much more uniform response throughout the entire space. So going with the multiple subwoofers is is really the, the way to approach this. Uh, and then, yeah. Like I said, you're not going to get full reference volume here, but if you did have like a pair of HSU VTF uh, 2 Mark 5s, even in the open living space, you're going to get some nice bass response that's happening during, you know, sports and that when the collisions happen during a football game or something like that, it's going to give you that, that nicer response. So I don't think you're crazy for wanting to do this. I think the solutions are there. It might cost a little bit more than I'm super comfortable recommending or that you were aiming for, but uh, yeah, those options do exist. Okie doke. So uh, I think I'm going to cut it there. I'd actually like to get Tom's input on uh, Michael's question. Michael is the last person on the list here. I'd like to have Tom's input anyway, uh, and that one was the last uh, to reach us this week. So Michael, we're going to hold off on your question until next week. Apologies for that, uh, but yeah, you'll be first up next week there. So I'm going to skip back up to the top here to thank our listeners of the week. One more time before I leave. Tyler, David, Jason, and Raf, thank you so much for your PayPal donations. Really do appreciate your financial support and uh, coming to our website, avrant.com. Going over to the right-hand side where it says support AV Rant, there's a picture of a cup of coffee over there that Tom made himself. He's so proud of that Photoshop job. So go ahead and click on that. It'll take you to PayPal. You do not have to have a PayPal account. You can just use a credit card if you please. And so thank you so much for everyone who donates that way. And then if you'd like to set up an automatic monthly donation through Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash avrantpodcast to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation. We have 133 patrons at the moment, so thank you all so much for your financial support. Aaron, thanks for continuing to send all those Canadian-specific uh, movie codes and uh, sometimes game codes that, honestly, I'm not going to use those, so uh, you can you can find uh, a better audience than myself to make use of those. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for thinking of me and, and uh, wanting to support us in whatever way that you're able to. Uh, and then for the notes of gratitude that uh, pour into this podcast, just for keeping it going through whatever happens to be happening, uh, Mike, Martin, Eric, Chris, Aaron, Henry, and Michael this week, thank you so much for your notes of gratitude and encouragement. They're very much appreciated. And a big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen to this podcast. Uh, if you would like to get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. So on behalf of Tom Andre, this has been AV Rant. I am Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.